Let's get peppy. Welcome to Pep 179. That's Pep or Planet Extra podcast. It's an offshoot of Planet America on, on ABC Australia, which you can see on Wednesdays at 9.30 p.m. on ABC TV and 8 p.m. on Fridays on ABC News or anytime you like on iView or Facebook at ABC Planet America or on YouTube on the ABC News in Death channel. On Pep, we cover all the stuff that's too nerdy for TV. If you're listening to us, you can also find Pep on YouTube and Facebook where you'll also find timestamps and show notes in the blurb. And if you leave a comment under those videos, we are likely to see it. You can also tweet us at P E P C H A S D R D A V E at Pepper Chaz Dr. Dave. If you want to contact us pri- privately, you can ask me on Twitter. I will allow you to direct message or email me, or you can just direct message me on Facebook. But for now, let's meet the man who never raises the stakes on inconsequential views. I'm talking, of course, about Dr. Pepper himself, self, Dr. David Smith. Hello, Dave. Hello. Hello, everyone. I am David Smith. I'm an associate professor at the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney. But I don't speak for either of those institutions. Mm. I only speak for myself. I don't speak for any other member of my household, human or feline. I I don't speak for my local suburbs a community Facebook page, though let me tell you that place is pretty wild. <laughs> But I don't speak for any of them. I only speak for myself. And the best thing about Pep is that we are now 179 episodes in and Dave still is up to his 179th <laughs> qualifier. He Every single time it's different. Very impressive stuff, Dave. For those wondering, it is. We are recording this on Friday, the 20th of September at 2.15 p.m., uh, I don't know what happened overnight. Or that, well, I know one story. There's one story you could not miss, and we will be talking about that story. But other than oh, that, yes. I don't know what happened overnight. Uh, so don't blame me if I miss something important. Let's get straight into the gratefuls. What are you grateful for, Dave? I am grateful for Oasis reuniting. Really? Yes. I am very, <laughs> very grateful for this. Now You have to explain this, Dave. Well, okay. So like everyone... I'm hoping that there are going to be fights on stage. Now, this might not happen. If it doesn't happen, though, at least we've got Jane's addiction to give us some of this uh, good material. Thanks to Pepper Ben for alerting me to this. Um, Apparently what happened, what you're about to see, is Perry Farrell got upset because the band's levels were too high and so he couldn't hear himself screaming properly. So he went and took this out on poor old Dave Navarro. Just have a look at what happens. So is Dave their sound guy? It's a bit strange. Why is he taking out on him? I don't know. No, he's not their sound guy. He's their guitarist. I know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Just, I love how decrepit everyone in that video looks. I love how confused Dave Navarro looks. <laughs> well, that, that was a long-running motif of his career, especially when he was with the Chili Peppers. But anyway, look, yeah. back to Oasis. What I'm grateful yeah. for is... Yeah, as a child, I would listen to a lot of my parents' music, things like Bob Dylan and John Lennon and and Billy Joel. And these were always people who wrote fairly meaningful lyrics. And so as a child, I was always asking my parents, like, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And it was a habit that stuck with me well into my teens that I would always hear lyrics I didn't understand and just assume that there was some great deep meaning that was uh, eluding me. It was Oasis that finally showed me, showed us all, that often lyrics don't mean anything. They were quite open about the total meaninglessness of their lyrics. And I think the the point at which this became really obvious to everyone was Champagne Supernova. In the sky. Yes, which contained the classic lines, Someday you will find me caught beneath a landslide. In a champagne supernova in the sky. So it ma- yeah. makes no spatial sense. No. Really no no temporal sense either, because also yeah. has the line, slowly walking down the hall faster than a cannonball. And Noel Gallagher was asked about that specific line, and he was asked, well, what does that mean? He said, I don't fucking know, but there are 60,000 people singing along to it. Obviously means something. <laughs> means something 
to them. And yeah. what I love about Oasis lyrics is it's a bit like Adrian Celentano's classic Prison Coal in Encinine Chuso. Oh. Well, I should not sleep in any kid in the sea to land a chisel on my top hole and get down. Let me go. We can see him in the sand and the shoes are coming up in. This is two of the cars that are before all the guys are staying. Hi, hi, my chance, let hey, the hills still throw it, feels up. Hi. First of all, that is a seriously great song. Mm. Second, if you were listening to that for the first time and thinking, I don't understand what this guy is saying, don't worry, that's the point of the song. It's written by an Italian who does not speak English. It's his imitation of what English sounds like to him. So it's completely meaningless. He's just putting in words that sound good. That's pretty much what Oasis was doing. They were using actual English words, but, you know, they were just putting in words that uh, sounded good to the music and this is how they were all able to write all of these great stadium anthems now not all of their music was written in this way okay so first of all they did have some genuinely meaningful lyrics on what's the story morning glory i particularly <laughs> really yeah yeah yeah. The, the song cast no shadow do you remember that one i don't know that one now no. that was the one song listening to that i thought ah okay I actually understand what they mean by this song. It's about this this guy who says, as he faced the sun, he cast no shadow. Oh. And as they, as they took his uh, soul, they stole his pride. And I thought, I know exactly what this is about, right? This is, this is about somebody who has given away so much of his own dignity that he basically ceases to exist. As he faces the sun, he casts no shadow. Mm. It turns out I was completely wrong. That's not what they meant by oh. that at all. Uh, Noel Gallagher wrote that about his good friend Richard Ashcroft from The Verve. Okay. So Oasis had become incredibly famous and successful incredibly quickly. The Verve had been toiling in obscurity for years. Mm. And Richard Ashcroft, he was happy for his friend's success, but he was quite depressed about his own position. So Noel Gallagher actually wrote this song, Cast No Shadow, to try as a tribute to him, to try to cheer him up. And apparently what he meant by Cast No Shadow was, oh no, he's so great. He's so one of a kind that he doesn't even cast a shadow on the earth. Okay. And it didn't work because Richard no. Ashcroft got even more depressed and left the verve three weeks later. By the way, I... I He's a very thin man. He, he probably does cast no shadow. He is. I, <laughs> I don't know why Noel Gallagher thought the verve were so good. Like, they were the opposite to Oasis. Their songs are narcoleptic. Yeah, they're kind of moody. Yeah. yeah. And I remember I bought that album that Bittersweet Symphony is on. Yeah. It goes for over an hour. I never finished it. Oh. And bear, bear in mind, I was 17 at the time. I was, so you were moody. I was at my absolute peak of receptiveness to bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> you were your vervist. Yeah. I mean, I, I owned a copy of Insane Clown Posse's The Great Malenko. That's how <laughs> undiscerning I was in my musical judgment. And even I, listening to The Verve, just thought, this is shit. But I, anyway. I like The Drugs Don't Work. That's one song. It goes for so long. The, yeah. the opening song of the album, I remember, was a song called We Are The Rolling People. Okay. It's very bad. Don't look it up. <laughs> I won't. But anyway, yes. so Oasis uh, started to go off the rails when they started to try to write meaningful lyrics. Yeah. And I think the absolute low point of this is, thanks once again, Ben, for this one. <laughs> ben. <laughs> I remember him playing this to me like 25 years ago. So this was from their album Standing on the Shoulder of Giants. Yeah. Not the shoulders of giants well, or the shoulder of a giant. Standing on the shoulder sense. of giants. If you're on a giant, you probably wouldn't be able to reach both shoulders. <laughs> probably right. <laughs> yes. This one was written by Liam. It's called Little James. It's about his son, James. Live for your toys, even though they make noise. Have you ever played with plasticine, even tried a trampoline? Live for your toys, though they make a lot of noise. Have you ever played with plasticine or even tried a trampoline? I just love the image that conjures up. Of Liam, like, having a beer with his baby son, going, oh, yeah, play with plasticine. Oh, I remember liking that as a kid. 
What I'm, about a trampoline? I'm not imagining with a beer. I'm imagining with a rhyming dictionary <laughs> in one hand. <laughs> just, <laughs> just leafing through it. <laughs> so anyway, yes, uh, yeah. grateful to Oasis. Although sure. Oasis is very specifically before about 1997. <laughs> Okay. And all the best of luck on their reunion tour. We all hope that it ends in a flurry of blows. <laughs> Gratitude uh, registered. I've got one that's largely in the form of quite a lengthy clip. Sorry to interrupt. This is Chase from the Future. I'm just going to cut out my grateful for this week because unfortunately we're about five minutes over on this pod and it's getting very late in the morning and I want to get the show on the road. So I'll just push this to next week and uh, let's get back to the pod. Let's move on to... Yeah. Oh, this is actually a bit of a tease because I'm not going to be doing correspondence. Hey. Oh. And the reason why is because this week has been insane. Mm. <laughs> it was insane even before the Mark Robinson story yes. broke. Yeah, yeah. And now it's more insane. So I'm going to try and organise a bonus pep sometime next week to deal with the overflow. Um, the L Hardy one, unfortunately, fell through at the last second. She's going overseas. So it was really tough. Okay. Um, but uh, I will try and squeeze in uh, another correspondence. Uh, uh, so I'll try and squeeze in some correspondence in Chaz Unleashed, should there be one at the end of this episode. I think we'll be out. We'll probably have 15, 20 minutes for me to get some stuff in there. Okay. At the end of the app. But I do have a quick one I'm going to say right now because I, whenever I really stuff up, I like it to be right at the top of the podcast. Okay. Because yep. I, li- I don't like people who hide from their corrections. Okay. Um, now, uh, now, last week I was talking about one of the fact checks in the debate. Yes. And uh, I suggested, this is, Dave, Dave disagreed with me. I did. I suggested that when you're talking about third trimester abortions, which are usually fetal abnormalities, usually, yeah. that when they give birth to the baby, as as Governor Northam said, uh, ex-Governor Northam, uh, when they give birth to the baby and they make the baby comfortable and then they decide whether to resuscitate the baby. I was saying I thought that was humane, reasonable, and a heartbreaking situation for everyone but that I could see how it was a gray zone, whether that would be considered by various people as killing the baby or not. And, uh, or I could as s- Trump would say, executing the yes, baby. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, I could see I could see two sides to that argument yeah. I was suggesting. Now, I got a lot of correspondence from doctors <laughs> a <laughs> lot, pointing out that that is exactly oh, the situation that exists in a lot of situations for older people who aren't babies. <laughs> Uh, that's exactly what occurs, for instance, with palliative care and in many other circumstances. And if I was suggesting that that could be seen as killing a person, then that puts me on the other side of the entirety of medical ethics. (laughs) And uh, so, and they are of course, absolutely right. And I was wrong. So I just want to get that right at the top of the podcast. And then I'll read more the next time I do correspondence, which will hopefully be at the end of this app. Uh, Because there's some good stuff there. Anyway, let's get into the content. There is a lot of it. Yes. Let's start with, (laughs) this feels like an eternity eternity ago, Mm -hmm. the debate wash up. Uh, Not because we want to talk about the debate anymore, but we want to talk about the fact there are no more debates. Mm. That that broke amazingly after our last podcast. Uh, Trump's senior advisor, Jason Miller, the morning after the debate, said that Trump had already said he was going to do three debates. Mm. He said that on CNN. Yes. At almost exactly the same time, Trump was on Fox saying, quote, I'd be less inclined to because we had a great night. We won the debate. We had a terrible, terrible network. That makes a lot of sense. Anyway, from that moment on, the number one mission was obviously for all good Republicans to work out a reason why this debate didn't count, even though Trump clearly won it, according to him. Uh, so I'm going to have some fun here because you're going to have all the fun with Mark Robinson later Mm. on. So I'm just going to go through my favorite. We're all going to have fun with Mark Robinson. (laughs) I just want to go through quickly my favorite conspiracies, which, which led to all debates being called off possibly for eternity. Um, Greg Kelly from Newsmax, number one. So, uh, problem about tonight already. First of all, this blue set is totally weird. It looks like a fish tank. Um, I don't know what's going on, but how about this? We the people, we the people, preamble of the Constitution, right? Well, okay, first of all, it's slanted, that's weird. But the other thing, we the people, some dumb New Yorker article came out about five years ago that said those are the most powerful words in the English language. The DNC 
took those three words, DNC 2020, and made it the theme of the convention. The purple chick from soccer. All your favorite liberals. We're on favorite liberals. We the people, we the people. And again, look at this again. We the people. I think it is a uh, nod to the Democrats, huh? What else is new? <laughs> First three words of the Constitution <laughs> of the United States. Yeah. The debate was taking place at a place called the Pennsylvania Constitution Center. Yeah. The fact that we the people was written on the set I would suggest was not a nod to the 2020 DNC. <laughs> Probably not. I, I might also just point, my take. I might also point out that at least for the last eight years, we the people has been written all over the set of every debate <laughs> since before the DNC. And by the way, you know what I like best about that clip? What the fact that you could just hear just softly in the background if you listen really carefully the sounds of the excuse police coming to arrest Greg Kelly. <laughs> Just the whole time, the siren was getting closer and closer. <laughs> anyway, next excuse. Mm. Uh, you're going to have to choose which one's the best one here, Dave. Okay. Jack Posobiec. Uh, <laughs> I guess, I got quite here. <laughs> Trump was on the left side of the screen with the camera pointing down at him, a classic filmmaking technique to make someone appear villainous. <laughs> There we go. That's okay. an excuse. Well, he's obviously more of a scholar of film than I am. Yeah, I don't think he's a scholar of anything. Uh, we talked a little bit on Pep, not Pep, on Planet America last week about the pearl earrings that oh. were supposedly e audio transmitters. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing is, when you look at the Nova H1 audio earrings, mm -hmm. I'll just show them to you right now, that, that they're supposedly a transmitter. Not only are they clearly not the same earrings as the ones she was wearing, so here are the ones that she was wearing, uh, but they weren't actually available anywhere at the time to buy, <laughs> even if she wanted to. Uh, that did get confusing for a while, because for a few days after the debate, the makers of those earrings did point out, did put out special editions of them ah. for, as, as, quote, presidential debates at $2,000 a pop. Trying to cash in. Yeah, obviously it was a bit of a joke. I, yeah. don't, know if, I don't know if they're actually, actually even actually selling proper transmitters or not, but, they, but you could buy them. Hmm. Uh, but it was pretty obvious that Harris's earrings were a golden pair of Tiffany hardwares. You can look at them right there. And you can see her earrings there. You can see they're the same. She's also worn those same earrings regularly before when not requiring an earpiece, <laughs> like when she's at Juneteenth, for example. And uh, Tiffany also confirmed to the Daily Beast those were their earrings. Uh, also, as I said last week, an earpiece would be very annoying during a debate. And no one who's ever used an earpiece would think you could use an earpiece during a debate. No. And most importantly of all, of course she didn't have an earpiece. She barely answered a single question all night. <laughs> Did you watch the debate? <laughs> anyway, another theory. Uh, this TikTok went super viral. One of the moderators, the, the lady that was up there, is actually Kamala's sorority sister. So you have the sorority sister, and then you have her best friend that is one of the execs. So now we know why there was a three-on-one debate. So we know that it, it was a biased debate. That's actually true. They are sorority sisters. Mm. What you might not realize, though, is that Harris graduated from uni in 1986 and Davis graduated in 1999, and they didn't go to the same university. <laughs> this is a national sorority. Mm. There are... I guess how many chapters there are of this sorority, Dave? Oh, I'm guessing several thousand. Uh, not quite. Uh, there is over a thousand. Not a bad guess. Mm. 1,074 chapters in this sorority in 50 states. 360,000 members. I'm not sure that was a factor in the debate. <laughs> My personal favourite, and I actually, uh, is a hat tip to Dave for this one, because uh, you sent this through to me. Uh, it might be Richie. It was on, it was on our little, little group chat. From Matt Wallace, inside report, ABC allegedly set up distractive <laughs> lighting aimed at Trump's podium to make him look left to right repeatedly during the debate and artificially increase his heartbeat. That was all in caps. 
and they included uh, this footage of Trump's eyes darting back and forth, kind of. This one here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, his, his eyes moved every now and then. Um, do you find that one convincing? Mm, no. <laughs> no, no. Uh, and then... Uh, then, then probably, uh, yeah, I'd say my number one concern with Trump was not his darting eyes. But uh, the, 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 then, then someone, this, this is where it really started to escalate. Yeah. Someone put out an affidavit. Have you seen the affidavit? No. Put out an affidavit supposedly written by an ABC whistleblower. There was a lot that was suspicious about this affidavit. There was a lot. <laughs> okay, firstly, it read like it was written by AI trying to be an affidavit in a school play. <laughs> it was not written like a lawyer wrote it at all. Secondly, there's lots of bits blacked out to not identify people, but not only do they black out the name of the person who supposedly was prepared to go to court with these allegations, but they also blacked out the name of the notary who is supposed to be the person who confirms it's real. <laughs> Thirdly, they wrote it and dated it supposedly before the debate. It was mm. dated the 9th of yeah. September to prove that they had foreknowledge of what would happen in the debate. Mm. But for some reason, they didn't actually release it until three days after the debate. <laughs> Fourthly, they referred to Manhattan as Manhattan, New York, which no one who from Manhattan has ever said, ever. Fifthly, they supposedly live in Manhattan and they're sitting on the biggest story ever told, but... They chose to release it not to Fox News or to the New York Post, which is right next door to where they are, mm. but instead they decide to release it to the black insurrectionist Twitter account, <laughs> a tiny Twitter account that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> Sixthly, <laughs> all the elements of this supposed agreement that was going on between ABC and Kamala Harris. Mm. Uh, included the things that conservatives have been whinging about for the previous three days. Like, for instance, they agreed to, quote, assurances regarding split-screen television views that would favorably impact Kamala Harris's appearance relative to Donald Trump. That's the Posobia clause, I believe. Uh, I don't know why that would be part of any agreement, but my favorite part of the agreement was, quote, no questions concerning her brother-in-law, Tony West, who faces allegations of embezzling billions of dollars in taxpayer funds and who may be involved in her administration if elected. That's a very explanatory <laughs> little paragraph, isn't it? I'm not sure that's how you'd write an actual affidavit. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Uh, that was an astonishingly unlikely condition, I would have thought. Um, but anyway... This got immediately laughed at by pretty much everyone, mm. except for one person in particular, yeah. podcast favourite Bill Ackman. Oh, <laughs> Dollar Bill! <laughs> yes, he wrote several multi-thousand word posts, oh, the only wow. kind of post that he writes, about how credible this seemed to him and they, and they needed credible denials to, uh, to convince him otherwise. And he hounded both ABC and Disney boss uh, Bill Iger personally online multiple times about it, seeking comment. Uh, seriously, that guy isn't the dumbest guy on the internet right now. He's getting real close. Um, Twitter does strange things to your brain. But yes. uh, anyway, just when it seemed it couldn't get more ridiculous, then Marjorie Taylor Greene tweets out, the ABC whistleblower who claimed Kamala Harris was given debate questions ahead of the debate <laughs> has died in a car crash, <laughs> according to news reports. Now, number one, there were no news reports. That's essential. Number two, no one knew who the whistleblower was. So how would news reports know that the whistleblower died in a car crash? Also, as Community Notes pointed out, the story that Marjorie Taylor Greene was linking us to mm had come from an unverified WordPress blog, <laughs> not from a news bulletin. <laughs> but the best part is that before Bill Ackman discovered Twitter, mm. the indisputed dumbest person on the internet mm. was Gateway Pundit. Yes. Right? Very, very dumb person. <laughs> very dumb. Jim Hoft. Yes. Very dumb. 
Gateway Pundit even didn't fall for this. Wow. <laughs> Bill Ackman, you should be ashamed of yourself. <laughs> Gateway Pundit offered a warning for people about the site that Marjorie Taylor Greene was sending people to. Holy shit. He was fact-checking Marjorie Taylor yes, Greene. but just wait for the warning. It's the first warning. Warning. This website is contaminated with a virus. <laughs> it's clear to us this is a complete hoax. <laughs> Surely, Dave. The plummeting IQs online have got to reach terminal velocity soon. Yes. They're, just, they're just falling faster and faster and faster, these IQs. Anyway, my point is they were desperate for an excuse. Yeah. So, okay, you want me to say what the best one yeah. was? Yeah, what do you reckon? They all failed. None really? of them got near Who? the king. The king? None of them got near the king. Who was the king? In 2020, do you remember Trump did this town hall thing with Susanna Guthrie on NBC that did not go very well mm. and it was one of these things that was so bad mm. no one could really pretend that it went very well but that doesn't mean they weren't going to defend him so on Tucker Carlson's show yes. Miranda Devine got on yes. and said the debate last week with Susanna Guthrie was a joke it was a disgrace so it was a town hall. It wasn't a debate. Yeah. She's calling it a debate. She just spent the entire time badgering him. And it was a setup from the start. He was sitting on a tiny little plastic stool, which could hardly fit half a buttock, let alone a whole one. And he was uncomfortable the whole time. Ah. The stool. Stool gate. <laughs> the stool was the only stool half a buttock. That couldn't, could only fit half of one of Trump's. Mighty buttocks. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll give her the prize for all time. That all the liberals are jealous of. <laughs> so they decided to, to punish him for his mess. And he couldn't have stood up. No. No, no. <laughs> yeah, so sorry. None of that gets close. Fair enough. To well, uh, Miranda Devine. Look, I mean, they might be all second, but, but they were good enough for Trump. He, he agreed <laughs> he that agreed uh, he agreed it was all rigged and therefore he shouldn't have a debate anymore. Uh, what do you think, Dave? Do you think it was a good move for Trump to say no more debates? No, I think it was quite unwise. Yeah, why is that? For Trump. Uh, well, if that's the last time that people see them interacting. Yep then Harris comes away with a clear advantage. Yep. I think even though the Harris campaign was very keen for another debate and certainly very keen to say they wanted another debate, the way that things went in that first debate, as, as you pointed out, Harris set all of these traps and mm. Trump walked straight into them. Like, I don't know if that would happen a second time around. Uh, e even... Trump would be able to see the traps being laid. I mean, he should have been able to see them <laughs> he should have. being laid the first time around. Yes, he should have. Uh, also, he knows what he should have said in the first debate. He would, say, he would actually say it in a timely way in the second debate. So I'm not saying he would win a second debate, but I'm just saying it wouldn't go as badly for him mm. as, as the first one would. And there have been plenty of instances of debates, like think, Romney versus Obama in 2012, where you know you have a clear winner in the first one, and but the second one, it might not erase the first one, but it kind of it it neutralizes it a bit, and that's what could have happened in another debate. So I I think I don't know if it's gamesmanship on his part, saying oh no, this is clear evidence that I won, that, that she wants another one and I don't. Uh, but I I don't think that it was uh, sensible for Trump. For what it's worth, I actually think him not doing another debate is a good idea. Okay. And the reason why I think that is because I agree with you, he'll be unlikely to fall in exactly the same traps again. <laughs> yeah. But there would have been other traps. Yeah, and, true. And, and the important thing is, I think that I'm, I'm, I'm starting to become sure and sure about Kamala Harris that she is a learner. Mm -hmm. Yes. She makes big mistakes the first time, mm -hmm. but she doesn't, she doesn't make the same mistake twice. Right. And I've looked at her National Association of Black Journalists interview the other day. Yep. Where they asked her, like, for instance, they asked her the four years question, mm. exactly the same question as the beginning yep. of the debate. She gave a much better answer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't like a winner of an answer, but it was mm. a much better answer than the debate. Yes. 
And yeah, she obviously went to school on that question because she didn't do so well on it, mm. and she she was better yeah. at it. No, look, I I think she would do well in a second debate. Yeah, and I think I, she I think she would be much better. In a yeah, second yeah, debate. but I just don't think he would do as as badly. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Yeah. but I still think that she would end up winning because yeah. she would do better. Yeah, anyway, but the, yeah. having said that, aside just quickly, if I was here, I still think he made a mistake because even though I think it's a good idea for him to not do a debate, mm. I think he could have pulled out of the debate with a lot more dignity and face. And what I mean by that is, I mean, they, rather than coming up with this pathetic kind of, oh, yeah, I won. I'm like, when a prize fighter loses a fight, the first words out of his mouth are, I want a rematch. Yeah, I won. Instead of doing that, he should have said, okay, you want a debate? Sure. Fox News, let's go. And he would have known she ain't going to do Fox News. Kamala Harris does not turn up where it doesn't suit her to turn up. Hmm. So if he said, let's go, we, we, we've just had your debate in your home turf, hmm. my turn. At least that's fair is fair. My turn. Fox News, let's go. She never would have turned up. No. And he could have just hounded her about being too chicken to go to Fox News. And he still wouldn't have got his debate, but he would have got a lot more dignity. And I think he would have, he would have uh, maybe not won the mind game, but he wouldn't have lost it as convincingly as he did lose it the way he backed out. So that's what I would have done. Yeah, and speaking of the wash-up from the debate, so Harris does seem to have gained in the polls. Yeah, a little bit. As uh, a result. Like a point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and it's not, yeah, it's not a huge gain, but it does seem to have changed things a bit. Mm. Um, it's because prior to that, Trump was really catching up to her mm. in, in the polls, and he doesn't seem to be anymore. But the polls are still showing just a very, very close race. Like Emerson and Maris both uh, just today produced a bunch of swing state polls. I don't think there's a more than a one or two point difference in any state with the exception of, I think it was Maris in Michigan. I had uh, Harris up by five. But yeah, so it's, it's still an incredibly close debate. Mm. Good, sorry, close contest. The, the debate was, uh, you know, as, as everyone was saying at the time, was not a knockout blow. But... I think that it has changed the whole tenor of the campaign. Yeah, look, it's uh, it's certainly. I, I I mean, I get that. It's not based on anything. It's just a vibe. But I feel like whenever nothing happens, it helps Trump. Mm. Like I feel like the fundamentals help Trump. Yes. And so when nothing happens, when this election campaign is drifting, yep. it helps Trump. And so and so what Kamala Harris needs from here to the election are four or five moments when she gets a decided little bump or win yes, yeah. to keep on not letting the race drift towards Trump. Yeah. And when people ask me who I'm betting on, mm. I always say super, super close. Mm. But if I was putting money on someone at the moment, it would be Trump because of that drift. Mm. That, that, that Kamala Harris needs to do work. If nothing happens, I think Trump wins. And so, the, and so she keeps on needing to do work, I think. And the debate was a good example of her doing some work. Mm. You know, like, and so that worked for her. But I think she needs a couple more of these. Not, I'm not, I don't mean debates, but I mean just something. Mm. Like just if, like, because that, that's, that's what was happening before the debate. Yeah. The drift was happening towards yes. Trump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is happening now, what, four or five times mm. when there's a period of a week or two where nothing happens. Yes. There's a gradual drift towards Trump. Mm. And uh, so anyway, so that, that, that's, that's my analysis yes. based on no logic whatsoever. Yeah. Well, no, th there, is a, there is a logic to it. So I suppose the mm. Walls-Vance debate is going to be potentially the next event. Potentially. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Uh, can I just say a, a couple more things about polls? Please. So the, the, a couple of very positive data points mm. for Harris in the last week were the Iowa Selzer poll. Yes. So this poll is famous for its accuracy. Yep. Like last year, about a week out from the election, when poll averages were showing Iowa was tied, Selzer, which only polls Iowa, came out and said Trump's in front by seven. He ended up winning by eight. So the, the accuracy of this poll is, is very famous. Uh, they had Trump up by four. As we mentioned on PEP back in June, the last one they had had Trump up by 18. So, I mean, there could well be response bias feeding into that, but that is just a very clear sign that Harris has made up a huge amount of ground yep. um, on Trump. So that was, uh, that was a good one. Uh, second, there was a very reputable in-state pollster in Alaska that had Trump up by five. 
Mm-hmm. That's a state that he won by 10 in 2020 and by uh, 15 in 2016. This poll, by the way, was of 1,200 people in Alaska. There are only 330,000 people who vote yeah. in Alaska. Like this, was, yeah. you're, you're never going to find a poll that is actually polling as much of the electorate yeah. as, as this. And when you think about the fact that it has uh, now returned a Democratic member of the House of Representatives uh, at least once and she's favoured to win again this time around. Like, it's not that far-fetched. Mm. Alaska is not, uh, is not completely deep red. So in terms of Harris doing well in states that she can't win but which could indicate that there are shifts going on that other polls aren't necessarily picking up, those are good data points. Another positive set of data points, as our boy Aaron Blake pointed out in the Washington Post, is that every poll that's been done that asks people who do you think is going to win, Harris is leading in those estimates by double digits. Yeah. Uh, now I'll, I'll put that back on the homework. Yes. Yeah, there aren't. It's, so I think it, it's things like 48 to 32 or 32 to 23. There aren't any majorities because no one really knows who's going to win this. But that, uh, th- that question about who do you think is going to win, there's one argument that that has more predictive power than polls themselves do. Um, so like that, that's certainly something that you would, that if you're Harris's campaign, you would want to see um, going in your direction. Uh, and then, of course, there was also the New York Times Siena poll that had her up by four in Pennsylvania, though that also showed a tied national race. So that was going in the opposite direction from um, other polls. Nate Cohn had a, uh, had a long post about this. Even though that national poll showed her tied, though, that was also still a two-point improvement from before the debate. Um, in terms of negative data points for Harris. First of all, so much of the swing state polling is so close and coming from good firms as well, coming from places like Emerson and Marist, it really just suggests she hasn't been able to get a clear uh, a clear break in these. And also Wisconsin, where she actually did have a solid lead for weeks, months, actually seems to be coming back to the same place that, uh, that all of the rest mm-hmm. of them are. Uh, the other data point for her, which is not so great, was when the Teamsters refused to endorse anybody this week, they did put out their own internal polling, albeit we know nothing about how this poll was conducted, but it showed, I think it was 51 to 33 of their members supporting Trump over Harris. Okay. And that was a turnaround from Biden had been getting 44 to 33. So complete turnaround. Now, what was significant about that? As I said, we don't know anything about how these polls were conducted or how reputable they are. We don't know anything, but we can at least look at change between two polls. And I so far had not seen any poll that showed Harris actually losing Biden supporters. Right, The reason why she'd been able to rise was because she was winning these groups that Biden was having trouble with and not losing uh, Biden supporters. So now we've got a group. This is actually something that shows where she's, uh, where she's losing, potentially losing Biden supporters, and it's in that older white working class. And it makes sense. Biden was so, like, he was so overtly pro-union. In yes. a way. I mean, like, I know she's pro-union as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, like, no, no one's as pro-union as Biden. Yeah. Now, I mean, there are some qualifiers that have to be put on the Teamsters, which is they, in the past, have supported Republican mm. candidates. They supported Nixon. They supported Reagan. They even supported George H. W. Bush, famous working man, hero of the people. <laughs> yeah. But they had supported Democrats since 2000. Yeah. Uh, the decision not to support anybody has caused a lot of tension within the Teamsters. So the Teamsters Black Caucus issued its own statement in support of Harris. There are Teamsters chapters in Michigan and Nevada that have uh, issued support for Harris. Teamsters remember, like, or Peppers will definitely know, this is Sean O'Brien's union. This is Mark Wayne Mullen, wedding yeah. ring off. <laughs> Stand your butt up. Yeah. Stand your butt up, big guy. So, yeah, one of the more uh, colourful characters in the union movement. So it's pretty appropriate that he's the, uh, the head of the Teamsters. And- which is one of the more colourful unions. And it's possible. I mean, we just, there's no way we can know. Yeah. But it's possible that the stunt of Trump getting, get, getting the team, uh, what is his name, Sean O'Brien. O'Brien to speak at the RNC paid off. 
Yeah, possibly. Like it might, it might have gone a few points. Might have. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, um, so yeah, the polls are very, very close. Yeah. Yes. Well, I was going to say the thing is that I only just say I say just two quick things that that the it seems to me I, I don't see a poll which doesn't have some weirdness about it. <laughs> like it's like one poll Pennsylvania is out of line. One mm. poll Wisconsin is out of line. One poll North Carolina is out of line. There's always one state that's just in a weird place. Yes. In every poll. Yeah. Yeah. Or the or the favorability is weird. Mm. Or the um. Uh, yeah. All the demographics are weird. Like, yeah. there's just no trends that are yeah. you, that are across the board. Yes. There's yeah, always yeah, yeah. outliers on every on every yeah. quality. So it makes it hard for me to be sure at this point in time what the trends are. Yeah, and, and there are some that keep registering quite big leads for Harris, mm. but they tend to be online panel polls, which mm. I, I wouldn't dismiss out of hand, but at the same time they are made up of panels who are really engaged, of people who are really engaged with politics yeah. in the first sure. place. So, And these panels registered almost no movement at all after the debate because they're already people who are really um, who are really paying attention. So, yeah, I agree. It's very hard to get a read on what is going on because the polls aren't all moving in the same directions. Yeah. Uh, you always think you've got a handle on a certain poll. Like, oh yeah, Maris, that's a, that, that one is a uh, democratic leaning one, but yeah, then it comes out and says, uh, actually Trump's winning in Wisconsin. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's very hard to get a read. The, the other thing, which I did say in Planet America, which is, I might as well, since we're talking about polling, I might as well mention it here, mm. is there was one weird poll, a morning consult poll, which, I, I, this might be the one where Harris was up by six. I'm not sure. That morning consult yep. put out a lot of polls, mm. um, but it was a uh, it was a there was a Senate uh, component as well. Ted Cruz was losing. I saw that one. Yeah, losing by one. Yeah. Now uh, I wouldn't get. I wouldn't if I was a if I was a Democrat. I wouldn't be getting overly excited about yes, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> because uh, yeah, there were plenty of times when O'Rourke was winning at one point in time yes. as well. Yeah. Um, the, uh, but, um, in the past, but, uh, yeah, Texas is a, is a hard place for Democrats to win, mm. but Montana might be kiss you goodbye at this point. In yeah, time. yeah. Like it's really starting to drift. Yes. And if that's the case, the Democrats are sitting there going, we, we have lost the Senate. Mm. We have like, if they lose Montana and they lose West Virginia, West Virginia is gone. Yeah. If they lose those two. They've lost the Senate no matter who is president. Yes. And. It might be a, it might be time soon, next couple of weeks, where they go, you know what? Forget Montana. Let mm. it go. We're going to just go all guns blazing yes. on Texas. John Tester's pretending not even to be a Democrat at this point. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. And if they decide to go all guns blazing in Texas, well, they are going to spend an outrageous amount of money there in the last month. Mm. And uh, and people will get really excited, and they'll probably get disappointed again probably. at the end. I mean, Flor- but, Florida would be the other long shot possibility. There are some tight polls in Florida, but there aren't any where Scott's losing. No. Whereas there, there is now there a is mo- one yeah. where Ted Cruz. Is so losing. let's see. If there's a few more. Let's see. If there's a few more where Ted Cruz is losing, and then that, that people might start getting interested. Mm. And just while we're talking about polling. Um, We've been talking about Alan Lickman way too much recently. <laughs> we interviewed Alan Lickman. We got an interview with oh, him on Play America. And I just want to sh- share two things, yeah. which you can watch the whole interview if you like on, on the Play America Facebook page. Um, I asked him the Mercury question yeah, and he gave a great answer. He did? He actually gave a great answer. I'll give him credit. It was a oh, great answer. Okay. And his answer basically, just to paraphrase him, yeah. you've got to paraphrase the guy because he's so ornery. He doesn't like being challenged. He gets yes. really pissed off yeah. and he doesn't defend himself well. But the I I will steal man his answer because it's a it was a good answer when you mm. translate it from mm. from pissed off <laughs> Lichtman Lichtmanese, um, yeah. Essentially, he, he, what he was saying was with the Mercury situation, mm. you don't know what will happen to the other keys if you replace the candidate with a dog. And the point he was <laughs> he didn't put it that way, but the point he the point he was making was in the case of Biden to Harris. Mm. What was unpredictable until it happened was that the third party key disappeared with mm. Biden. And like and so Harris actually gained the key there. And also the um the the uh resistance, the, the social unrest key also went with Biden. Like the Gaza stuff became less of an issue with Harris than, than Biden. And like he's saying you don't know what's going to happen to the other keys until there's a change. You shouldn't, pro- you shouldn't project forward. You know, all the other keys will be stay the same. There might be a third-party challenge if you've got a dog there. <laughs> like there might be a, like, and so, and so in actual fact, 
it's not accurate to say all because Kamala Harris gets eight keys and there's no character component or, or candidate quality component, the dog would get eight keys if the dog was a Democrat because some of the other situations might change. So I, I think that's a good answer. Okay. What isn't a good answer, it was a terrible <laughs> answer, and you can watch for yourself, is that this arrogant dude <laughs> was so not liking being challenged. He, he, I don't think he even fully processed what I was asking him, and he should have. Because it's a pretty basic question. Surely he's used to being challenged. Well, I don't think he's used to being challenged on this one. Because okay. he didn't have a good answer okay. at all. Which was, the, 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 the question was, why is it that you used to say it was about your model showed the popular vote winner, and now you say it's the Electoral College winner? That's changed. And, like the, uh, and, uh, and I thought models don't change. And the uh, this and, is why you want to be to get that article for you. Yes, I ah. asked. I asked Dave for the article because yeah, because I, I I had reason to believe that in his actual actual uh, prediction in 2016, in the actual prediction itself, the academic prediction, he wrote that the model, the keys model, only projects the the, the popular vote winner. Mm. Yes. Which means, according to his own prediction, he got it wrong in 2016. Uh, and he really didn't like that. Oh. That, that implication. Uh, anyway, so you can, you can watch for yourself. And you can decide if he's got a good answer. I think he had a crap answer. But, the, um, but, uh, but you can decide for yourself. Okay. Dave, talk about the assassination. Okay. Mm. Well, first of all, it wasn't an assassination. Yeah, I, you're right. We, we, probably, we probably shouldn't even call it an assassination attempt because he didn't even put his hand on the gun. Like, it's just... He's just, it, was, it was a planned assassination. Look, it, as, it, was a nice, it was a nice camping trip. As my colleague at the US Studies Centre, Jared Monshine, has pointed out, if you broaden assassination attempts to include plots that get foiled, there's actually a huge number of them. Mm. There's, I mean, there's way more than we realise, like, Obama was subject to these. Uh, There's been more than 10 for Biden and Harris. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this, you know, if we're talking in the realm of an assassination uh, plot, this is actually something a lot more common than um, what we had in Butler, Pennsylvania, which is actual shots fired. Now, having said that, it's far, far too close for someone to come with a, a, you know, with a weapon like that to the president. Now, the other big difference... Between this and Butler, apart from the fact that there was no shot fired at the president, is we know a lot about the would-be shooter in this case. We sure do. We still know almost nothing about the shooter at Butler. We do, though, know a lot about Ryan Routh. (laughs) And even though the protocol is, you know, not not saying a shooter's name. Yeah, you're not observing that. No, no, because he didn't shoot. (laughs) That's true. Didn't get a shot off. That's true. Didn't get a shot off. And also, um, this was somebody who had achieved some measure of fame (laughs) before he did this. Like, usually shooters are absolute nobodies until they do this. This guy, I won't call him a somebody, but he. He had been interviewed by the New York Times. Yep. Okay, so. And Romanian Newsweek. And <laughs> Star of Romanian Newsweek. Okay, so for, for those of you who don't know the story, mm. uh, Ryan Routh has something of a history with weapons. Mm. So. <laughs> yes, he does. He, <laughs> he was, and actually go, go, going right back, the first time he appears in the media was in a, uh, so he's, from North Carolina, was in, I think it was an Asheville newspaper in, uh, or I can't remember if it was Asheville or Greensboro. Uh, anyway, it was a city in North Carolina, their newspaper in 1991, about how he prevented a rape. Uh. He was uh, he was given some like crime, fi- uh, crime fighter award and you see a photo of him, he's wearing a suit, looking very clean cut, looking like a man who's going places in the world. Mm. That's 1991. Well, he certainly went places, but maybe not the places you would have (laughs) predicted from that article. He was arrested twice and charged twice in 2002 with possession of a weapon of mass destruction. Mm. Now, when you hear weapons of mass destruction, you might be thinking bombs. It wasn't that. It was actually a machine gun. That's a weapon of mass destruction. That's a weapon of mass destruction. A machine gun is the one gun you cannot buy in the United States. Machine guns are banned under federal law. 
even though the NRA says they shouldn't be banned, they accept the legal existence of that ban. You cannot have a machine gun. So that's a fully automatic weapon. So not only did he have a machine gun, when he was stopped by the police, he barricaded himself in a building with his (laughs) machine gun. Yep. Now, it's not entirely clear how all of this turned out legally, but just, let's just bear this in mind, okay, that you've got someone who's been arrested twice in the same year for possessing a weapon of mass destruction. So it was, he came back with a machine gun a second time? I think so. So it's not like this, the same incident, there were two charges. It's very hard to piece this together. It's just that he really likes machine guns. Yeah, yeah, it's very hard to piece this together from news reports. Maybe someone yeah. has got a better read on this yeah. than I do, but I know he was charged yeah, twice. Yeah, sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if yeah. it was over, yeah. over separate incidents. Mm. Okay, so that's a, that's a bit of background. And then the more recent background mm. is he was very upset about the invasion of Ukraine. Yes. Okay, good. You could say that. So were a lot of us. Yes. Most of us didn't go to Ukraine. No. Okay, maybe he's putting his money <laughs> where his mouth is. Most of us did not come up with schemes to recruit Afban, Afghan soldiers in Iran who had fled the Taliban to go and fight in Ukraine. Yeah, most of us did not. Most of us did not do that. <laughs> most of us would recognise that no matter how much we care about Ukraine, this is not a good idea. I can't make the point as well on yes. that note. <clears throat> yeah. That when he tweeted in all caps, Yes. I am willing to fly to Krakow and go to the border of Ukraine to volunteer and fight and die. Yeah. Not only is that a strange thing to do, mm. but it's a stranger thing to tweet. <laughs> Why would you announce that that's what you're going to do? That's strange behaviour. Yeah. Yeah, it is. So he, he was interviewed by a reporter from the New York Times who was writing up this whole article about Americans with dreams of fighting in Ukraine. This sure. reporter wrote another article about this a few days ago and said, yeah, I never thought that I would hear from this guy again because yeah. he clearly had no actual plan of how to do this. He was yeah. talking about getting fake passports and uh, organising oh. transport and... So, like, he had a great plan. Meeting with members of Congress. Just, no. Yeah, no, yeah, no, no, no. He had a great plan. Fuck okay. you, Dave. He had a great plan. Okay. Tell me what his plan was. He tweeted Elon Musk <laughs> saying, I would like to buy a rocket from you. I wish to load it with a warhead for Putin's Black Sea mansion bunker to, uh, to end him. It doesn't have to be new. It can be old <laughs> and used as not returning. That's a, that's a foolproof plan. Elon Musk let him down. Elon Musk should have responded to that. Yeah. <laughs> and imagine, like, yeah, it could have been plan. spared a second assassination attempt. <laughs> Trump could have finished his game of golf. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway, so, yeah, ov- obviously these plans <laughs> did not come to fruition. No, they did not. Um, we're not really sure what happens in the next year. So he lived in Hawaii. He was, a- it was originally. Um, Described as a Hawaii resident, but he'd been a lifelong North Carolina right. resident. Anyway, so somehow he gets hold of a semi-automatic rifle. Oh, hang on. No, there is one other thing that happens in uh-huh. the meantime. What's that? He self-publishes a book on Amazon. Oh, yeah, that's a good book. The days of the <laughs> online manifesto are over. <laughs> right? It's, it's the self-published book on yeah. Amazon now. And, I mean, when people say this guy's politics are all over the place, you really have to see a page from this book to understand the sheer extent to which his politics are all over the place. Yeah. So he's so big on Ukraine, but the title is Ukraine's Unwinnable War. Okay. Maybe he decided it was unwinnable when his scheme to recruit Afghan soldiers fell through. And when I don't Elon know. didn't reply. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, the, the book is apparently mostly full of just atrocity pictures. Mm. Uh, but then on the last... <laughs> okay. Uh, in the last few pages, there's all of this gibberish about the Iran nuclear deal. Look, he's a fan of the Iran nuclear deal. So am I. Mm. But... <laughs> yeah, I was hoping there was a but. Once again... <laughs> yes. Like, I'm not going to write any self-published Amazon book, first of all, related to Ukraine. Sure. 
uh, about this. Are you going to go to the border of Krakow and die? I'm not going to go to the border of <laughs> Krakow and, and die. Uh, <laughs> heaped praise on John Kerry. Yeah. But he kind of admits that he voted for Trump yeah. in, t- in 2016. Yeah, he yeah. says he felt responsible for putting this retarded baby <laughs> president That's, in. That is the, that is the phrase he that used. That was the actual phrase that he yeah. used. And yeah. I, I, sorry, I regret repeating an offensive oh. phrase. But once we get into Mark Robinson land. <laughs> there's worse coming. There's, there's worse coming, people. <laughs> Strap yourself in. That's uh, why I didn't mind swearing before. I yeah. thought oh, I shouldn't even bother trying to resist uh, swearing yeah. in this app. Uh, he, so he invites people to assassinate not only Trump, but to assassinate him <laughs> as well for his role. Really? In electing Trump. He was electing to be punished with assassination. Yes. <laughs> right, okay. Yes. <laughs> right. So, yeah, he is a bit all over the shop politically. It's a bit arrogant for him to call his own death assassination, I would have thought. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't that famous. Yeah. Good point, Chaz. Good point. <laughs> anyway. Anyway. Yep. So he somehow obtained this semi-automatic rifle. It was initially described mm. in news reports as an AK-47, but it was not an AK-47. It was something else. I'm going to take a guess that he got it entirely legally with no problems at all. Probably. Despite the fact that he had twice been arrested for possession of a weapon of mass destruction <laughs> and had been trying to wage a one-man war in Ukraine. <laughs> sure. And all of this is a way of saying the gun situation is going to make it harder and harder for the Secret Service to do their jobs. Okay, the, you know, yeah. the conversation immediately goes to failings of the Secret Service, even though they did actually succeed technically, mm. this time. Mm. You know, it goes to why were they letting him hide in the bushes for 12 hours? <laughs> um, you know, okay, all, you know, why did, why did he get within four or 500 yards of the president? Look, all legitimate, all legitimate questions. But how are you going to really be able to protect anyone in a society where somebody who was arrested for owning the one type of gun you're not allowed to own in the United States is later on after trying to fight a one-man war in a foreign country using soldiers from another foreign country, is allowed to obtain a semi-automatic rifle and carry it around with him in Florida? That's a good question. There was some polling from the Public Religion Research Institute that was uh, released just a couple of weeks ago that asked people whether they agreed with the statement that because things had got so bad in the country, uh, patriots may need to resort to violence to save the country. Mm. Now, I thought this was a very well-asked question because most questions that are asking about political violence ask, do you think that political violence is justified? Mm. And that's kind of priming people to say no. What was well-asked about that question was they were actually describing it in terms that people would be thinking in if they were justifying political violence. In other words, we need to save the country. Um. Now, the findings from that were overall 16, this was a bit, so about 5,000 people, overall 16% of people agreed with that question, uh, 27% of Republicans, 8% of Democrats. Now, 16%, obviously, that's a, that's, that's a minority, that's less than a quarter of the country, but in a country of 340 million people with... Uh, you know, around about the same number of firearms in circulation, including about 70 million semi-automatic rifles. Mm-hmm. I, I'm just very pessimistic about the prospects of the Secret Service protecting anyone. I mean, it's it, like, yeah, it, it's surprising and shocking that these assassination attempts happen and get so close. But at the same time, it's surprising there aren't more of them. Yeah. Like, it, and... The part of the problem is, and you know, it's a it's a very obvious thing that's that's well understood about sh- high profile shooting violence is the copycat effect. Yeah, um, I would not be surprised if Ralph hatched his plan to do this after the Butler shooting. Copycat effects can last a long time. One of the few things that the FBI knows about the Butler shooter is that he was looking up stuff about the JFK assassination. He was looking up stuff about Lee Harvey Oswald. Once that is part of a country's political repertoire, it's hard to make people forget about it. Mm. Um, 
So I just don't think that the you know the the prospects of stopping it. I I don't think that it it's just going to be about beefing up the the secret service, which is undoubtedly what's going to happen because as soon as this happened, Democrats were falling over themselves to say Trump should have the you know the full protection. Which he, I mean, of the he really should have. Yeah. Like, I mean, I'm surprised he didn't, to be honest. Mm. Like, especially after the first assassination <laughs> yes, attempt. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, my God. Yeah, but they're saying that's why they couldn't secure the the, yeah. uh, the perimeter of the, the golf course. But, mm. I mean, you know, Trump likes doing things outdoors. Mm. You kind of think any any outdoors scenario is is going to present opportunities to people who are determined enough and have people and have access to weaponry that is powerful enough uh, which, unfortunately, is just very commonplace in in the US. So, yeah, the, I sure completely legitimate to ask questions about the Secret Service, but I think this is bigger than a Secret Service problem at this point. Okay, it's fair. Um, I all I really want to say about the execution, the execution, the the, the attempted assassination, uh, was that there is a uh, it's been a kind of slightly disturbing, I mean, unsurprising, I guess, mm. but a slightly disturbing push with these two right from the, right from the moment it happened to go mm. straight to Conspiracyville. Yep. Like in a way that they didn't with Butler, like they mm. waited a little bit yes. before yeah. moving that direction. Um, like, and from people who shouldn't be conspiracy theorizing, like for instance, the, the the sheriff, the Martin County Sheriff, Will Snyder. Oh, yeah. Who came out with this doozy. I think what we're finding out is not from this area, which, of course, raises the bigger question is, how does a guy from not here get all the way to, Mar- uh, to Trump International realize that the president, former president of the United States, is golfing and is able to get a rifle in that vicinity? I think that's the question the FBI, the Secret Service, or, or, or laser focused on today. Is this guy part of a conspiracy? Is he a lone gunman? If he's a lone gunman, President Trump is that much safer because we have him. But if he's part of a conspiracy, then this whole thing really takes on a very uh, ominous tone. I don't like that language at all. No. Like, he, he comes off like a guy who just put on a sheriff suit. Yes. Like, he does not come off well, like so a sheriff at all. Those questions are incredibly easy to answer. Yeah. Which is, as, as newspapers have pointed out, it is well known that on weekends when Trump is at Mar-a-Lago, he usually plays golf somewhere in the vicinity. Yeah. He usually plays golf at one of his courses in Florida, and this is the closest one. Second... How did he obtain a rifle? Because it's the United States of America. <laughs> yes. Because generations of politicians have made it as easy as possible to obtain rifles, even if, like in the case of Ryan Routh, you probably really shouldn't have one. Yeah. Not a conspiracy, except if you're looking at a conspiracy of <laughs> you know, Congress to ensure that it's as easy to obtain rifles as possible. And he clearly didn't know that Trump was going to be there because he was waiting for 12 hours. He just thought, like, he was camping out there. Mm. He was waiting as long as it took for Trump to play golf. Like, and, he, and he, I think, reasonably guessed that Trump would play golf at some point in time because he plays a lot of golf. Yes. So, the, yeah, I, yeah I'm, I'm not feeling that quote at all. <laughs> i got to say... Um, the only other thing I want to add about this, uh, before we get to the rhetoric stuff, yes, is like we we talked about the Elon Musk tweet, mm. and we talked about <laughs> we talked about his tweet that he was going <laughs> to volunteer and fight and die, but we missed we missed the what he actually spent most of his time trying to do the last few years. What's that? Which is to persuade Bruno Mars, Sting, U2, Elton John, Five for Fighting, and the Dave Matthews Band to record a pro-Ukraine anthem. Wow! Just imagine those all those people in a song. <laughs> Just imagine that would be a weapon in its own. <laughs> that song. And he didn't ask Oasis. Yeah, well, see, that's why it didn't get together. Yeah. Because they, they really bring people together, yeah. I find. They're real <laughs> uniters, not dividers. That's right. Yes. <laughs> and Perry Farrell and Dave Navarro. <laughs> 
So yeah, I I I, I, wow. I, I love that. I love that a lot. That is great. I did notice some of the f- the first media reports after his name was released. Mm. New York Post was first out of the gates before anyone had made the connection between these interviews in the New York Times and stuff because yeah. they clearly got to his social media accounts first before they were <laughs> deleted. And they, they kind of gleefully pointed out that he'd supported Vivek Ramaswamy and Nikki Haley. Yeah, a little, a little and, super ticket. And tried to persuade them to yeah. stay in the race. I, I do have that, that, that tweet here. Uh, here you cannot quit. Why? You must stay on the ballot to the end. You must fight. You must continue giving speeches and push all the way to election day, no matter the election results. Do not give in. Join Nikki and he's, he's running to Ramaswamy and keep working. Never give up. Inspirational stuff. It's like the Mighty Ducks. Yeah. So inspirational. Has Ramaswamy responded to this? No, no one ever responds to him. <laughs> Poor Ralph. <laughs> Nobody's so angry. Nobody's, no, no one he's got is antsy. Oh my god. He's got yeah. these great ideas and no one's listening to him. Yeah. All right. What do you reckon about the rhetoric? I think that the rhetoric about the rhetoric has been <laughs> bullshit. <laughs> that, can, you, can, you, can you spell that out a little bit? So, yes. yes, there have been a lot of Republicans. J.D. Vance has been at the forefront oh, has he ever? of this blaming Democratic rhetoric yeah. for the assassination. In yes. Fact, I think we should follow J.D.'s train of thought <laughs> Let's. here. Yeah. He was talking about the fact that Hillary Clinton had said that people should get prison time for misinformation. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And he's saying, well, if you're saying that someone should get prison time for misinformation, then, you you know, it's a short step from there to saying you should put a bullet in their head. Is it? Is it, is, is it a short step? I actually <laughs> think it's a fucking massive <laughs> step. <laughs> I think it's a really big step. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. a very big step. I, I think it's a huge step. <laughs> okay. I mean, this is the increasingly tortured logic we've come to expect from J.D. Vance. And of course, of course, sorry to interrupt, but, yeah. but I mean, I'm sort of skipping ahead here. That exact kind of point is the problem. Yes. It's not the specific, specific language you use. It's your tone. Yes. It's the, it's the crazy factor. Yes. The more you add to people being crazy, yeah. the worse it gets. It's yes. not about going to saying to person X, you deserve to and no, no, I won't put yeah. it that way. Say so saying, oh, I wish someone would kill you or something. Mm. And then, oh yeah, and then someone's gonna go and listen and they're going to kill them because you said that. No, that's not how it works. Yeah. How it works is if you put set everyone on edge, yes. and they all become nervy and paranoid yes, and yeah, nuts. Yeah. Yes. They will make the leap themselves. Yes. You don't need to point in the direction of the of the target. No. They will make that connection themselves if you make them nuts enough. Yes. So anyway, go on. Yeah. So there's been a lot of this kind of criticism directed at Democrats that because they're accusing Trump of being a threat to democracy and a mm. would-be dictator, that's encouraging people to kill him. Yes. Now, first of all, if we look at these two shooters, obviously we don't know very much about the first one, but everything seems to suggest he had your classic school shooter profile yeah. rather than your political assassin uh, profile. Yeah. As for Ryan Routh, to put it mildly, he was marching to the beat of his own drum. <laughs> yes. I don't think he's being persuaded by any Democratic Party uh, rhetoric. Although the drum was being played by Fight for Fighting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 So actually, no, I'm going to correct you. He de- he did actually cite. I'm not being sarcastic here either. He did actually cite Democrat rhetoric at one point in time. What was that? Which was when he was uh, when he was tweeting Biden at one point in time. Mm. He he explicitly used the phrase "democracy is on the ballot." Ah, which is yeah, that's the okay. catchphrase. Yep. It's like so, it's not like he wasn't listening. Um. But I do agree with you. I'm not, I, I mean, yeah. I'm just acknowledging that. Okay. But I, I, I agree with you that he was a self-motivator. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah. Now, I think this is an attempt to shut down completely legitimate criticism. Yep. The fact that Trump's been shot at once and almost shot at a second time doesn't change the fact 
He tried to overturn a democratic election in 2020. Yep. He has made it very clear he's not going to accept the results of this one. Those are facts that don't change. And there is nothing wrong with pointing that out. Yeah, I agree. Uh, absolutely nothing wrong with pointing that out at all. I think that they are using this to try to shut down legitimate criticism. But to look a little bit deeper at this issue, uh, one thing that's been pointed out a lot is the idea that if you call someone a fascist or a Nazi, then that's a particularly kind of, that's particularly inciting language. You know, America fought a world war against fascists and Nazis. Fascists and Nazis are seen as people beyond the realms of political acceptability. And if you're constantly calling someone a fascist or a Nazi, then, you know, maybe that is going to incite violence because people will think it's okay. Okay, reasonable point. Until you look at who actually uses the word fascist the most. Yeah. It's not Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. No, it's not. It's, uh, it's, it's absolutely not. Their language has been very closely scrutinised by journalists over the last few days and, yeah. and weeks for understandable reasons. Yeah. Uh, they're not the ones accusing people of being fascists. Well, I was going to say that, I mean, they, they've they pulled back on the democracy stuff. Yes. Why? Like, they've pulled way back on that. Yeah, like, yeah. Like, I mean, I actually, I mean, I said this on Pep at the time. Yeah. I thought some of Biden's language yes. was ridiculous yeah, with yeah. the dictator stuff. I thought, he, I thought he went way too far. Mm. But Kamala Harris, as soon as she took over, just, just pulled that lever right back. Yes, yeah. Like, I just think that, I mean, you just need to look what Trump was citing as her troublesome rhetoric was just from the debate, yes. her just, her, her saying almost nothing. It yeah. was really tame. Yes. Yeah. So who's using the word fascist all the time? Trump. Yeah. And, but he, he uses them as a, as a quadruple, yes. as, as a quadruplet. Yes. Uh, fascist, communist, <laughs> Marxist, and what's the other one he uses? Um, uh, radical, leftist. Uh, whatever. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's, socialist. He's, yeah. He's socialist. He uses them all at once. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So nobody's really got a leg to stand on here. Mm. When it, I mean, nobody from that side really has a leg to stand on here when it comes to uh, that kind of inciting rhetoric. Well, you know, Trump, when he, when he uh, like he came right out of the gate and, and blamed them straight away. Yes. When he came right out of the gate and blamed them immediately, in that first statement, he literally followed, literally followed mm. directly after criticizing them for their insightful rhetoric. Yes. With insightful rhetoric. Yes. Like literally, like, like, this is what he wrote. This is what he said. He believed, talking about Ro- Ralph mm. here, he believed the rhetoric of Biden and Harris and he acted on it. Their rhetoric is causing me to be shot at when I'm the one who is going to save the country and they are the ones that are destroying the country, both from the inside and out. These are people that want to destroy our country. It's called the enemy from within. They are the real threat. Yeah. Like, like that is in, that, that language is more insightful than anything Kamala exactly. Harris has said. Exactly. And yeah. especially going back to that PRRI question about asking people, do you think that viol- you know, patriots will need to resort to violence to save the country? Yeah. When you're constantly talking about the need to save the country, that is classic inciting rhetoric because that is justifying yeah. violence. Mm. Um, now, I mean, Trump can say that all he wants. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, and he's going, to, he's going to say it all he wants. One of the things I noticed about this attempt is that there were some very gratuitous uh, attempts by people to really bring it back to the first assassination, to to relive the greatest hits from the first assassination attempt. Yeah. So you had Mike Johnson saying Trump was clearly protected by God. (laughs) Again, for a purpose. Now, okay, the first time around... Like, I don't think that Trump was protected by God the first no, time around I so. because I no conception of God that I can imagine. I can't imagine God saying, no, that bullet's not going to direct, not going to hit Trump. I'm yeah. going to direct it into the head of one of his supporters instead. Mm. Um, but anyway, but I can see why people thought that this was God protecting Trump because it, it was, the shot was fired, it got so close, blah, blah, blah. This time, 
No shot fired. This guy with a backpack and a gun was chased off by the Secret Service a few hundred yards away. I mean, what? How are you seeing the actions of God in this? <laughs> Fair question. <laughs> like, uh, maybe God made the Secret Service people see the nuzzle of the gun. Maybe in yes. the bush. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Yeah, God. It's a, it's a lot less godly. I've God got to say. put the thought in the head of those Secret Service guys. You've <laughs> got to play a few holes in front of Trump and make sure you look at the trees. Yeah. Okay, maybe, yeah. but. Yeah, I thought that was a bit pathetic. I, I thought also the connecting of the two assassination attempts with the the use of the term they, yes. they did this, yeah. then they did that, as if it's all the same group mm. of people controlling yes. these assassinations. I I I don't like that at all. No. Like that's, that's an example I was talking about before. Very gentle language mm. in terms of the words used, but the concept makes people crazy. Yes. It makes people paranoid. It makes people think that there's this collection of they out there yeah. that is, you know, secretly trying to kill Trump. Mm. And that's not going to make, that's not going to create good results. No. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, what, do you, what do you reckon about the argument from Scott Jennings from CNN? I want to throw this one to, uh, out okay. there. Okay. Yep. The Scott Jennings argument is essentially that Trump is uniquely under threat. And so we should, and so he, there should be a double standard with Trump because he's the one they're attacking. Uh, but, but the rhetoric is on both sides. It's, it's coming from the right, the rhetoric, it's coming from the, the left. The rhetoric, they have tried to kill this man twice, okay? He, he got shot in the ear and this guy was sitting up shop outside of a golf course to try to kill him this weekend. And I know, it, I know after something like this happens, it's very fashionable to, you know, talk about rhetoric on both sides. Donald Trump is the target, okay? He's the current target. And it's happening, and it's happened again. And I just, uh, honestly, we, we have to have a conversation about elections. If you lose an election, the country's not going to come to an end, okay? What I want Democrats to do, honestly, is to say, it's okay. Like, if, if Donald Trump wins, democracy will not end. The Constitution will not end. We're not going to live in a dictatorship. There will not be a bloodbath. All the things they say that are totally fabricated to me, it would be a good day to stop doing that. It's not taken two parts. The first hmm. part, Trump is the target. No one else is the target. Is that a fair thing to point no, out? No, it's not. Okay. No. There are all kinds of people in the United States who are targets, mm. uh, who are po- targets of political violence. Mm. This morning, a judge in Kentucky was killed in, the, in his chambers by a county sheriff. Well, he's a target as well. Don't know why. <laughs> yes, yes. Point is, yeah. it, they're acting as if, Trump is the only victim of violence in the United States, is the only victim of political violence. I mean, as you pointed out, there have been something like 10 plots directed towards Biden and Harris. Yeah, that's why that's that, I was about to go. <laughs> that have been <laughs> yeah. foiled. Yeah. Uh, Trump has been unlucky in terms of how, you know, how close these attempts have actually got. Mm. Um, <laughs> Trump has made all politics in the United States almost entirely about him for the last eight years. Mm. I'm certainly not saying that there should be violence directed against him, but in ter- but if people are asking, you know, why Trump? Mm. Why? It's because everything has been about him for mm. the last eight years, and that's how he has wanted to make it. Okay. Well, let's take a second part now. Yes. The, about the, you know, it's not the end of democracy, all that kind of stuff. Stop saying, mm. stop saying that, 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 that he's a threat to democracy because it's scaring people. Democrats would be listening to that. And, I'm, and I imagine a lot of our peppers would be listening to that and go, hang on. Trump is a threat to democracy. What are you saying, Scott Jennings? Mm. We have to say it because it's true. That should be an election issue because mm. it's real. That's not. That's not rhetoric. No. That's actually a fact. Uh, Vance said this week, we cannot tell the American people that one candidate is a fascist. And obviously, as you said, you know, Trump says Harris is a communist and is a fascist and is a Marxist and all at once. Um, but to quote Jonah Goldberg, who I should quote more often because he writes some good stuff. 
shouting fire in a crowded theatre isn't irresponsible if there really is a fire. <laughs> so, uh, this is the guy who once wrote a book called Liberal Fascism. I know, I know, I know. But he's, yes. he's come a long way since yes, then. Yes, okay, yeah. okay. Um, and I remind you of yeah. an amazing grab from early in the year, which just did not get the play that it should have. I think we play it once on pep and that's it. Mm. It should be played a lot. This is Mark Esper, mm. Trump's defence secretary, mm-hmm. talking about what happened behind the scenes mm. during the George Floyd protests. Mm. The president is ranting at, at the room. Uh, he's using a lot of, you know, uh, foul language. You know, you, you, you all are effing losers, right? He's going to finally give a direct order to deploy uh, paratroopers into the streets of Washington, D.C., and I'm thinking with weapons and bayonets. And this would be horrible. What specifically was he suggesting that the U.S. military should do to these protesters? And he says, can't you just shoot them? Just shoot them in the legs or something. And he's suggesting that that's what we should do, that we should bring in the troops and shoot the protesters. The commander-in-chief was suggesting that the U.S. military shoot protesters Yes, in the streets American of our protesting. nation's capital. That's right. Apart from the fact I hate the interviewing technique of 60 Minutes where mm. they just repeat what you say back at you yes. and just waste lots of time. Yeah. Apart from that, I mean, that is a threat to democracy. That what is. We just heard, and there's no way he's lying. No. He's his defence secretary. Yes. <laughs> it's, uh, um, so, so, yeah, so, so what's your view about that? Obviously, you don't want to load up unnecessarily emotional rhetoric and yeah. all the rest of it. But where is the balance when someone is actually a threat? Yeah. But you don't want to say it too much because well, you, you don't want to encourage crazies. I thought Harrison Walls had actually managed to thread that needle mm. where they'd actually tried to reduce him to mm. something who was – uh, that they didn't want to think of as this really fearful source of threat all the time, someone who could be defeated, uh, you know, someone who they thought of as weird rather than rather than threatening. Yeah. Like, to, to, you know, credit to them, they had managed to do that. Mm. But Scott Jennings, I mean, that condescending, someone's got to sit down with the Democrats and tell them, no, if Trump gets elected, it'll be okay. It'll still be <laughs> democracy. Could he give that talk to the other side, maybe? Have you, have you heard about Trump? Have you yeah. heard Trump talking about what's going to happen if he loses? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there's and, definitely I mean, hypocrisy. It's, it's true that the bloodbath comment has constantly been taken out of context, but you don't need it. Mm. Trump talks about this election in apocalyptic terms. He does. Yeah. He absolutely does. And so I think that one of the things that Democrats are going to resist is unilateral disarmament. Mm. Right. If if Democrats pull back on the threat to democracy rhetoric, Republicans are going to keep doing it. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I don't think they're going to do that. So, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah it's, no. This it, this has been a, a waste of time. I was going to say the 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 real the true measure of how bad faith that criticism is, in my yeah. view, was um, I'm not sure if you saw this. Uh, Trump's campaign sent out 50 examples of of supposedly horrific rhetoric from the, from the Democrats. Mm. It was headed, Democrats used increasingly incendiary rhetoric against President Trump in the days, weeks, and months leading up to the two assassination attempts. Now, because I'm me, mm. I, I went through all 50 of these examples. They are so lame. <laughs> I, 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 just, I just brought one. I yeah. brought one which I thought was the lamest. Okay. Of it. Remember, this is... This is in a list of incendiary rhetoric that yes. supposedly inspired assassins, yep. okay? I'm going to play you one grab from Gwen Walls. Gwen Walls. Yep. Imagine, when she, ever she says turn the page, she's making an exaggerated, this is for the listeners, mm-hmm. an exaggerated motion with her arm like she's turning the page of a giant storybook. Right. Okay? Yep. So just imagine that. Yep. I'm going to play it for you. This is Tim Walls' wife, by the way. That is right. I need you to be with me and practice with me. What are we going to do? We're going to turn the page. Oh, pretty good. Do it again. We're going to turn the page. And we're going to turn the page. All right, so I'm going to be watching you because when I see Wisconsin... And I'm one watching National Land TV because it's a pretty important place and Minnesota will help you practice with this. You just show me this. Turn the page. Right? Turn the page. And you know what else that looks like? 
Bye bye. <laughs> bye bye, Donald Trump. Apparently, that incited the assassins. Wow. <laughs> and by the way, if it's not clear enough that that is terrible faith to yeah. suggest that that grab inspired yes. the assassins. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just look at in real time the caption that the Trump war room gave to that video when they tweeted it out originally. The caption, you can read it right there, Dave, is confirmed. Gwen Walls is just as cringe as Tampon Tim. Didn't sound like they were worried about that rhetoric no. at the time. It sounded like, now, look, admittedly, they, that list was probably put together by an intern, but it just <laughs> shows you what I'm talking about. Yeah. That it's a completely bad faith criticism. My God. How fragile would you have to be <laughs> to find that threatening? I know. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> Never come into the ABC because Big Ted is going to terrify you. <laughs> anyway. Uh, oh, yeah, let me ask you one more question about this. Yes. There, there's On rhetoric, there was an obvious yep. double standard going on last week where yes. the left were trying to tie Trump and Vance to the bomb threats through their rhetoric mm -hmm. and the right were trying to tie the left to Ralph through their rhetoric. Mm. And both sides were trying to avoid being tied by the other one while tying the tie. You see, it was one of those legitimate both sides moments where they were both literally doing the same thing at exactly the same time. My question to you is, mm. in your view, are they both at fault? Is neither at fault? Or is only one at fault? Is the whole thing just a bullshit argument? I think there's a far clearer link yeah. between... Trump getting up in a debate and saying immigrants are eating dogs and cats, yep. repeating things that Vance had said, mm. and then, like, then in the next few days, people making bomb threats against elementary schools in Springfield and black people in Springfield, Haitian or otherwise, being subjected to racial abuse about eating dogs and cats. Mm. I think that connection is actually incredibly clear. I think there's a much clearer connection between that and Gwen Walls going, <laughs> turn the page, bye, Donald, and Ryan Routh, fresh <laughs> off his failure to get five for five against Bruno Mars in the same room, taking a gun to a golf course. Yeah. I just think there's a far clearer connection on one side of that equation. Um, yeah, I look up. Uh I, I do agree that there yes. is definitely a close. I mean, look, I I think that it, we're about to get to the Haiti stuff. Yeah. I, I think I think that the problem with the Haiti stuff mm. is that it's incredibly bad faith yes. from, from Vance and Trump. Like yeah. they both clearly know mm. that they're spreading bullshit. Yes. But if what Vance was saying was true, mm. that what he's trying to do is just trying to raise awareness of a very important <laughs> issue. Yes. If that was actually the case. Mm then I'd say, fine. Mm. Like, that's okay. Like, you're, this isn't an election campaign. You should be pointing that stuff out. That's fine. I mean, I don't think that's the case. It is obviously not what no, he was doing. No, I know. Yes. I know. But what I'm saying is the point is not the rhetoric. Yes. The point is are you, are you legitimately trying to criticize someone in good faith or not? Mm. And if you're not, then you're part of the problem. And if you are, then that's okay. Yep. I mean, that's my, that's my take on okay. it. And, and so the reason why I agree with you yes. that there's a closer connection yes. between Trump and, 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 and versus the, the other side, yeah. the Harris side, is because I think that there was much worse faith yes. from, what, from what Trump was saying than from what by, Harris was saying. By the way, Vance rather epically tried to work this in to his incredibly tortured uh, thing about if you say that someone should be in jail for misinformation, then you're saying that there should be a bullet in their head. Because he was talking about, because he was aware of the fact that this criticism was being made about him. Mm. He said, no, 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 the, the problem here isn't rhetoric, it's, it's censorship. He said, that's the problem. It's not the rhetoric. It, it's the censorship. It's... Isn't he, isn't he trying to censor? Well, this is the thing. He's <laughs> saying people are saying that because they disagree with my claim that immigrants are eating dogs, then that therefore I'm peddling misinformation and that, you know, that then the next step is assassination. 
But at the same time, Democrats shouldn't use the word fascist. Yeah. <laughs> right, okay. As yeah. he faced the sun, he cast no shadow. <laughs> it's only the theme of the yes. of the pod. Oh, I found, uh, I just happened upon that that tweet from uh, from Ralph to Biden. I might as well read it out Oh, to you. yes, yeah, please do. Your campaign should be called something like CADAF, Keep America Democratic and Free. <laughs> Trump's should be Massa. Make American slaves again, master. <laughs> That'd be Massam, by the way, Ryan. Democracy is on the ballot and we cannot lose. We cannot afford to fail. The world is counting on us to show the way. So more of that inspirational rhetoric. Uh, you really missed it. It's calling. How many uh, likes and, and reposts did this have? Unfortunately, all these tweets have been taken down oh. because his account's been suspended. Wow. It's such a shame. We'll never know. Okay, Dave, do you want to go... Straight into Mark Robinson, or do you want to go go to, go via Haiti? Um, let's go to Mark Robinson. Okay, go because for it. I've only got about an hour left. <laughs> okay, I've got a lot to say about the Haiti situation. Yes. Let okay, me tell you. yeah, okay. go 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 for Mark Robinson. Yes, so then. Mark Robinson is the Lieutenant Governor mm. of North Carolina, who yeah. is running for governor. Um. Overnight, I had been texting with a friend of mine in the US about a show from the 2000s, which I mentioned before, called The Boondocks, uh, which is actually rather pertinent to the story that we're just about to tell, because Mark Robinson very much resembles a character from The Boondocks called Uncle Ruckus. Okay. So uh, because of this, I got a text from him at at four in the morning, which woke me up, and I just happened to (laughs) check the news, and it said... Republicans bracing for news about Mark Robinson. Okay, so this is before it had come out. I'm like, what could they possibly be bracing for at this point, Mm. right? They already know that Mark Robinson has described abortion as murder while also explaining that he paid for his wife's abortion. Yes. Right. They know that he has called the Holocaust like a load of bullshit or something. I can't yeah. remember exact, exactly what his, his words were. It was something not good. Yes. yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like they, you know, they, they know that he's a very strange guy. They know that he's trailing in the polls by 14 points mm. currently. Like what, what could possibly be out there that could actually be like bad news? Okay, before we get to that, <laughs> yes. you might be wondering, how did Mark Robinson actually get into this position in the, in the first place? Yeah. You know, how did he get to the second most powerful post in North Carolina politics and become the Republican nominee mm. for governor? How, how, how did he get to that? Is he one of these uh, you know guys who worked his way up through local politics and uh, uh, you know developed a support base in North mm. Carolina eventually man sort of primary campaign no 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 it's none of that his political career begins in 2018 prior to 2018 he was an entirely private citizen he was wor- working in furniture businesses in North Carolina not quite private enough well, as it turns out well yes <laughs> very good point <laughs> yes Um, But in 2018, when there was a discussion in Greensboro, North Carolina, about uh, cancelling a gun show in the wake of the Florida Parkland shooting, Mark Robinson, just private citizen at that point, gives this speech at a Greensboro town meeting. I didn't have time to uh, You have to give us your name. I'm sorry. My name is Mark Robinson. I live at 4015 Sassafras Court. That's right here in Greensboro. I've lived in Greensboro all my life. Uh, I didn't have time to write a fancy speech. I didn't have time to, you know, I didn't have the the resource of an English teacher to sit down and write a speech with at school today and be, you know, brought over here or practice or anything. What I really came down here for is this. Uh, I've heard a whole lot of people in here talking tonight about this group and that group and domestic violence and blacks, these minorities and that minority. What I want to know is when are you all going to start standing up for the majority? And here's who the majority is. I'm the majority. I'm a law-abiding citizen who's never shot anybody, never committed a serious crime, never committed a felony. I've never done anything like that. But it seems like every time we have one of these shootings, nobody wants to blame, put the blame where it goes, which is at the shooter's feet. You want to put it at my feet. Now, okay, that's a very effectively delivered speech. 
His his claim that he hadn't practiced it is quite obviously bullshit. <laughs> yes, and you is. know how you can tell it's bullshit? Because at the very start of that video, he actually starts saying, I didn't have time to write a fancy speech, but then he gets interrupted and asks, his. Uh, he has to state his name. And then he goes back into, I didn't have time to write a fancy speech. So cle- yeah, yeah. clearly this was a very well uh, practiced yeah. speech. Now, Although he is, I mean, we should say, he, yeah. the reason he is where he is, he's a charismatic guy. He's very charismatic. Yeah, yeah. that's a very charismatically delivered yeah. speech. In terms yeah. of the content of the speech, mm. like complete bullshit. Yeah, uh, sure. And also quite unremarkable bullshit. You can mm. hear the same stuff being delivered probably at any school board meeting in the United States just not with that kind of uh, not with that kind of charisma. Yeah, that, that line "I'm the majority" yeah. uh, was very effective. That got put on some right wing influencers' Facebook page, and um, uh, two years later, his political career was launched. Mm. So he dropped out of college uh, and dropped out of his furniture business in order to take up full time speaking engagements. Mm. Um, and yeah, he. Successfully, uh, he cleared the thirty percent threshold in the uh, in the Republican primaries because he'd become this kind of cult hero. Uh, by this point, ended up de- you know did the typical thing of defeated an establishment candidate. Uh, was up against a Democrat in the I can't remember what year would have been twenty twenty. Uh, yeah, twenty twenty lieutenant governor election. Whoever would have won that would have been the first African American ever to hold that post. So he wins. But the point is, he comes from nowhere. Like, it is purely on the basis of social media picking up this speech that he gets to where he is. So he doesn't go through what most politicians go through, which is this kind of career-long vetting process where everything they do gets scrutinised. Uh, no, he didn't He didn't have any of that because he was just this guy who came out of nowhere with a, uh, yeah, with a great speech. Um, and the kind of enthusiasm of it really carried him along of course he picks up trump's endorsement as well Mm. and this is absolutely key uh trump describes him as like martin luther king on steroids (laughs) better than martin luther king twice as good as martin luther king (laughs) okay this was sorry it was actually 2022 i think his race was twice as good as martin luther king uh was trump's description of it also the, uh, one of Harris's accounts was posting this today, described him as like a fine wine. Mm. Yeah, now Trump doesn't even drink, so I don't mm. know what his idea of a fine wine is. But the point is, it's just all of this enthusiasm for somebody who just pokes the liberals as hard as possible. Yes. Like that is the, you know, the more extreme, the better. Like, ha, 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 look at how much he upset all these liberals by saying that the Holocaust was bullshit. Mm. Um, yeah, so anyway, it does turn out that someone like this, well, let's just say there are certain drawbacks to <laughs> having him as a candidate. And to finally get to the point of the story, one of the drawbacks has come out today. Yes. Which is that between 2008 and 2012, um, he was a, let's say, patron of the site Nude Africa. <laughs> Such a good name. Nude Africa. Nude Africa, if you yeah. haven't already deduced it, is a porn site. Yes. Okay, so he was a very frequent, prolific, and voluminous commenter <laughs> on Nude Africa under the name Mini Solder. Mm. The way that CNN attached this name to him is because he's also used it on multiple social media accounts um, for Amazon reviews of remote controlled helicopters. <laughs> Like it, it, it's very, very clearly him. Oh yes, it is. It is absolutely him. My my favorite bit of, I mean, you should read the whole article. We could go on yes. forever on this, yeah, but yeah, the, yeah. but the my favorite bit of evidence that it's him. Yes, is that there was a YouTube account attributed to Mini Solder, which only has videos of Mark Robinson <laughs> before he was a politician. Yes. So yeah. Pretty sure that's him. Yes. Now, as you can say, you can read the article. We'll we'll post it. That will spare me from reading out too many of the <laughs> details because I mean, some of them are really disturbing when he's describing um, peeping on women in a public gym. Uh, that's just uh, yeah. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read that out because uh, it, it's really disturbing. 
Um, the lot was made of the fact that even though he's been this massive anti-trans advocate in North Carolina, he has this line, I like watching tranny on girl porn. That's fucking hot. It takes the man out while leaving the man in. Oh. And yeah, I'm a perv too. Mm. But he does take pains to point out that he is not gay. And, oh. and he doesn't like gay shit. <laughs> right. He doesn't call it gay shit. He uses another word. Oh, I see. Um, it's good to get that stuff straight. Yes, yeah, yeah. So to speak. Yeah. <laughs> now, at one point on this, um, someone... Uh, yeah, some of this is really unreadable. But um, <laughs> I think yeah. your standards are higher than mine. I'd read it for sure. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, someone accused him of being white supremacist uh, because of the fact that he was in reference to Martin Luther King. Yes. Remembering that Trump said he was Martin Luther King on steroids, mm. twice as good. His view on Martin Luther King: get that fucking commie bastard off the National Mall. Mm. Someone accused him of being a white supremacist. He responds, I'm not in the KKK. They don't let blacks join. If I was in the KKK, I would have called him Martin Lucifer. Another word that starts with a noise, which I'm (laughs) not going to, uh, not going to repeat. It's a racial slur. (laughs) It it is indeed. Sounds very close to King. Uh, Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yeah. It it is indeed a racial slur. So, um, Look, I don't think that we need to go that much more <laughs> into the uh, into the content of mm. it. Um, you've you've had some of the greatest hits, but there is a lot more in this article. Yeah, um, there's a lot like, more a lot more since the article as well. Yes, yes, yeah, and th- I mean this is what really got the headlines. Mm. Uh, writing in a forum discussing black Republicans in October 2020, Robinson stated unprovoked, "I'm a black Nazi." In caps. Nazi in all caps. <laughs> yeah. Now, I saw there was one of the New York Times is typically clueless things where they go and talk to undecided voters. Yeah. They talk How to do you s- feel about black Nazis? <laughs> well, they talked to a guy in North Carolina yeah. who said, oh, are you aware of these comments of him call- mm. calling himself a black Nazi? And this guy who's a Robinson supporter and a Trump supporter just said, I don't believe that. There's no such thing as a black Nazi. Now, look, I can see his reasoning. You would not think that there's such a thing as a black Nazi. (laughs) But in fact, in the United States, there are black Nazis. Yeah. And they somehow all seem to be in Trump's orbit. (laughs) Mark Robertson, Kanye West. Yeah. Candace Owens wouldn't call her a black Nazi, but she did say Hitler's Mm. problem was if he just stopped at making Germany great again, then it would have been fine. His problem was starting the Second World War. Mm. So, you know, these people do exist. They are very weird. (laughs) And there's yeah. one place that they all tend to end up. Uh, then, of course. At, at Nude Africa. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I was texting with another friend in the US this morning thinking, how could he spin this for campaign ads? Yeah. Like the, the comment, uh, I'm not in the KKK. They don't let blacks in the KKK. Yeah. If I was in, I would call him Martin Luther. But you could just spin that as Mark Robinson is not in the KKK. Sure. Yeah. I'm sure it would work perfectly. Now, how about this one? I'm sure all would be forgiven. How about this one? Slavery is not bad. Some people need to be slaves. I wish they would bring it back. I would certainly buy a few. There you go. Mark Mark Robinson supports small business. (laughs) Okay. Mark Robinson supports jobs for all North Carolinans. Look, he certainly supports entrepreneurs on New yes. Africa. There's no doubt about yes. that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, um, we have not got into the uh, more erotic side of his writing, which I'm not going to <laughs> get into. Uh, sure. Richie has dug up some stuff. Yeah, Richie's into this story. <laughs> Richie's really into this story. Yeah, but but anyway, apparently the New Africa archive is entirely searchable, so you can you can find it. <laughs> <laughs> you find it yourself if you want. Yeah. So, um, this article came out today, about nine hours before the deadline for withdrawing from the ballot in North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, even if you did withdraw from the deadline in North Carolina, by that there still would have been a problem that his name would have been on the ballot. Because they can't, the, the ballot's already being printed. They can't reprint it. Um, okay, so that deadline passed while we were recording. I'm not seeing anything suggesting he uh, 
he dropped out. He was never going to drop out. He's never going to drop out. And in fact, a few hours ago, the North Carolina GOP said that they supported him. They said he has categorically denied the claims. Oh, well, there you go then. They didn't say we categorically deny (laughs) the claims, but they're they're like, we're stuck with him. Oh, by the way, on that point, another thing from that Greensboro speech Mm -hmm. where he's beginning to get worked up, he said, I've never committed a serious crime. Ah. (laughs) Serious. 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 Serious crime. Yeah. 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 Now, incredibly heated fantasizing is not a crime. No. But some of the other things he was describing are definite crimes. The peeping Tom stuff. Yeah. That's, that's, that, a, that's a crime. That is a, that yeah. is a definite, uh, a definite <laughs> crime. So, um, okay, you know, there were a lot of people who wanted him to get off. And the fact that this story was only released he, a few hours. He did get off many times. That was a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Walked right into that one. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so there's a story in the Washington Post. Scott Lassiter, Republican running for state Senate in North Carolina, called on Robinson to suspend his campaign. Lassiter said in a statement, North Carolinans deserve a viable choice in this election. Okay. Sorry, you're not getting a viable choice. You're carrying this one to term. Hey, woo! <laughs> yeah, so he was never going anywhere. Yeah. Uh he, he has denied it's it's yeah. him. I mean After the after the Access Hollywood tape, no one is ever pulling out ever again. No. Like from from it like anyone who's a Trumpist is never pulling out of a campaign. No. Yeah. And I mean, on the one hand, you could say, okay, this is way before he ever thought about getting into politics. This is more than 10 years ago. If it was sub stuff like, you know, the usual sort of stuff that comes out is uh, someone has very different politics from how they used to, like J.D. Vance yeah. calling Trump America's Hitler or something, or they've had some sort of flirtation with something disreputable. Mm. Uh, this is on another level. <laughs> yes, it this, is. This is really on another level. Yeah, no, I, like like CNN didn't go into detail on on some of those messages. No, they didn't. Like Richie is going into detail with his yeah, messages. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I'm telling you what I'm seeing from Richie alone, <laughs> just going you, you, like it's not about. I'm not offended by anything he wrote. Like it's it's it's. I don't get offended by anything. <laughs> but um, but you just go. You've turned yourself into a joke. Yeah, and, and it's not going away. Like there's just. The people are going to be laughing about these posts. Yes, as long as this as he's a public oh, figure. Yeah. yeah, so he can't escape no, it for the rest of my life. Whenever I meet anyone from <laughs> North Carolina, I'm asking them about this. Yeah. Um. So, I don't know what effect will this have on the election. Well, I think it's fairly clear that he's not going to win. <laughs> he's not going to be the governor. He's no. not going to be. He was already down. <laughs> <laughs> already down by fourteen points. Yeah. Yeah. The people who were trying to get him out of the race were Republicans who are now really worried about the down ballot effects and yeah. possibly the up, the up ballot, ballot effects. The up ballot the effects. Issue. Okay, so there was one. So Travis Acker's claimed today because that uh, even though Robinson said it was Josh Stein who leaked all of this stuff, mm. uh, Travis Acker's is saying it was a Republican group who leaked it, and the the timing was very specific. Now, the, yeah, because it was a few hours before the withdrawal date for the ballot. I don't mm. know that I buy that. But, well, mm. well, if they did, that seems like bad strategy. Yeah, that's dumb. Because I mean, look at how long it took to get Biden off the ballot. Yeah. Like three weeks. It takes a long time to to mm. shift people. They're not going to panic mm. and you know make a snap decision. Well, he certainly he's certainly not going to. Mm. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the potential up ballot consequences. Mm. Given that the poll averages in North Carolina are rarely more than one percent in either direction, it was the the closest race in the yeah. last election, I believe. Or no, the, yes. the closest race that, that Biden the, lost. Yes, yeah, yeah. The closest election. one that Trump won, one point three yeah. percent. Now, yeah. albeit North Carolina often does look like the football that Lucy keeps pulling away from mm. Charlie Brown, mm. uh, but like it really, really does look like a, a toss up this time. Mm. Generally. You wouldn't expect the up ballot effect to be that big. Um, usually, the effect works the other way around. Mm. That you would expect a a presidential candidate either to have positive or negative um, effects on the race. You see, if a presidential 
candidate is polling very poorly in the state. Down ballot candidates will try to distance themselves from them. That's what John Tester is doing in Montana yep. at the moment, where Harris does not poll very well at all. Mm. Um, no, but in this case, like Trump's been way, way ahead of Robinson for a long time. So if anything, you would expect Robinson will outperform in the election where he should really be because of the uh, because of the Trump factor. Mm. Um, but even if a few people just think I can't bring myself to vote for this party at all, or I can't bring myself to vote for Trump because he spent so much time endorsing Mark Robinson. That was a fine line. People in North Carolina will know that it was Trump who put Mark Robinson where he is. Mm. And even though Trump actually has been distancing himself more from Mark Robinson recently, um, the last time that Mark Robinson was on stage with Trump was at an event in North Carolina where Trump asked all of these veterans to come up on stage and Mark Robinson just came up on stage with them (laughs) without being asked. Yeah. Um, he's not, he hasn't been mentioned very much. He hasn't been asked to come to, so they've been trying to distance themselves, uh, from him, but people will know about the association between him and Trump and Harris is going to try and make that as clear as possible. We are looking at an election where it could be decided by a couple of thousand votes. Mm. There could be a couple of thousand votes in this. Yeah. Yeah. That's why they're panicking. And just to be clear what this means, uh, if you win, if, Kamala Harris wins North Carolina. She still can't lose Pennsylvania unless she wins something else. Mm. Nevada will do. She's ahead in Nevada at the moment. So Nevada and North Carolina equals Pennsylvania. But North Carolina alone equals Michigan or Wisconsin. Yes. So it it gives her a lot of insurance. Yes. Yeah. 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 So North Carolina and Pennsylvania have basically emerged as the two key states Mm. in this. Yeah. So, uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, this. it is possible that this could be the porn forum that decides the election. <laughs> you didn't know. No. In 2008, 2012, that nude Africa was where the 2024 election was going to be decided. <laughs> but this could be it. Could be. Well, it'll be interesting to see how the Trump campaign responds over the next few days. I'm guessing Trump's going to say he's never met him before. Oh. Uh. Doesn't know who he is. Never heard of him. It's I, he might go that way. I mean, he might throw him overboard, but he might yeah. he, he might also just pretend this story doesn't exist. Yeah, like I don't know. I don't know anything about it. It uh, he, he likes that one. Hmm. Yeah, but no, I'm sure we'll be talking about this story more. I'm sure we will be. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna talk about Haiti till you have to go. Yep. Okay. <laughs> right, let's go. Let's do it. Uh, all right, I'm going to skip the Aurora. I might talk about Aurora later on because Aurora was was an important setup for this because mm. they're desperately trying to make this this uh, election about immigration. Mm. All right, I've got a bit of a step by step here. All right, so first of all, uh, let me tell you about, about the Haitians. Uh, after the the Haitian earthquake in 2010, Haitians were allowed to get TPS, that's Temporary Protection Status, visas with America. Uh, that which means they stay for two years and they get a work visa. And the uh, and often the government will extend that for a longer period of time, maybe permanently. Uh, and they did extend it until 2019. That's when Trump revoked the TPS status. He this was when he allegedly called Haiti a shithole country, mm-hmm. and he said that Haitians people don't remember this quote so much probably have AIDS. That's an interesting quote. And he wondered why they couldn't get migrants from countries like Norway That's instead. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So, so those who suggest Trump's a racist, I don't know where that comes from. Um, then, in, look, to be fair, these are all off the record mm. types comments. So you don't know if which what's made up, what isn't made up. Mm. Like it's not like the Mark Esper one. No. Uh, then in 2021, the Haiti president was assassinated in 2020, uh, was assassinated and it became super chaotic there. Uh, yep. still is. So Biden then restarted the TPS visa program and he began a parole program to allow up to 40,000 parolees from Cuba, Nicaragua, Haiti, and Venezuela per month. The Haiti born population in America, as a result of that, 
has uh, those moves has increased from 800,000 in 2021 to 1.1 million today. Mm. And the Biden administration also recently extended the TPS status to to 300,000 more unauthorized Haitians. These were the ones who were who came illegally mm-hmm. and now they're legal. Mm. Uh, okay, so now most Haitians in America have a TPSs, pretty much all of them do. Okay, Springfield was a dying town. It shrank from 80,000 in 1960 to 59,000 in 2020. The local manufacturing plants were the major employers. They closed down. And Springfield's median income dropped 27% from 1999 to 2014. Mm. So it was dying in the ass. Coin to Pew. Oh, dear. I said, I think I said it was Gallup on uh, Play America. <sighs> Doesn't matter. Coin to Pew. Oh, no, 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 she, no, no, that's okay. According to Pew, that was the steepest decline of any metropolitan city in the entire country. Sorry, have you or have you not committed survey crimes? No, 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 I'm okay. I'm okay. okay. I, I got the got the two ones mixed up. That's okay. fine. That's fine. Uh, no, <laughs> we're going to stay our survey jail. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was it. So, so, yeah, there's the steepest decline in income, meaning, meaning income in the country mm. between 1999 and 2014. It was screwed. Mm. Okay. But then Topray moved in, a large Japanese uh, auto parts manufacturer, and they built a new plant there in 2017. Well, the town basically solicited them to come. The town began a revitalization project. By 2020, other companies were moving in. There were 8,000 new jobs on the table to be filled. There weren't that many good workers wanting to fill those roles. Mm. Haitian migrants started to move in to take those jobs. And they've been good. They were hard workers. The locals appreciated them. This here is from a PBS documentary talking about the the, the Haitians as employees. Jamie McGregor is the CEO of McGregor Metal, which makes welded parts for the auto and farm industries. Right now, about 10% of his workforce is Haitian, over 30 employees. I wish I had 30 more. Our Haitian associates come to work every day. They don't have a drug problem. They'll stay at their machine. They'll achieve their numbers. They are here to work. And so in general, that's, that's a stark difference from what we're used to in our community. The backhander there. <laughs> uh, um, that man, by the way, that you saw there, yeah. uh, Jamie McGregor, he's uh, been inundated with death threats since that, uh, since that particular bit, bit of footage. <laughs> Uh, there have been suggestions that he's a race trader and he should be executed. Wow. And that's a bit of a theme coming. Every yes. single person who says anything nice about Haitians yeah. gets death threats, suggestions they're a race trader and that they should be executed. Mm. Uh, furthermore, since Haitians are, are Christian, they've been revitalizing the, the churches as mm. well. Our churches, do we see new people? In the pews? Yes, absolutely. Wes Babian was the pastor at First Baptist Church for almost 20 years. For years we've lost people, but you hope somebody else will come and take their place. That, that hasn't happened here. Until now. Because there are folks from Haiti who are coming to church. Now I should also make clear, it was planned that they would come. They didn't just, they weren't dumped there. They mm. didn't just, just, dis, just appear out of nowhere like magic. Uh, Mayor Rob Rue told residents at the last commission meeting that while the city didn't know about the possibility of a large immigrant, immigrant population coming, a network of businesses knew what was coming. Mm. They wanted more workers. Mm. Uh, Rue said that he was upset the city didn't get a chance to plan for the immigrants. Mm. Springfield's now saturated, he said. Okay, so, so more came along then. And according to the city manager, about 20,000 of them have moved in the last four years. That number has been disputed. Mm. I will return to that okay. later on. Let's say 20,000 for now. Yes. Okay. First problem was their driving, mm. the Haitians driving. This sounds like a joke. It doesn't appear to be a joke. Right. Mike DeWine, the governor of Ohio, is extremely supportive of the Haitians. Mm-hmm. He has also been accused of being a race trader and, 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 and told he should be executed. He refers to the cat eating thing as a piece of garbage that is simply not true. Mm. But he openly notes they tend to have a problem driving. Mm. Uh, he says many of them didn't drive back in Haiti. And those that, that those that did drive didn't drive under the, under the same conditions and the same rules that mm. they're now driving under. A number of them got 
got driver's licenses in different countries like Mexico and yeah. other countries in South America. Uh, the, uh, he said that the pass rate for driving tests is 16 to 17% mm. from Haitians. But here's a, here's a little fact about Ohio. If you're an adult, you don't need to get driver education. Wow. You just need to pass the test, mm. the driving test. That's it. Mm. And so what they, so what Mike DeWine said is that these guys, they have jobs. They don't, they don't want to waste time getting driver education they don't need. Mm. So they just keep on coming to do the test until they pass it. Right. They'll have a good test. They pass it. Great. They've got a license. Mm. Doesn't mean they're a good driver. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and so, and so it's, apparently it's an issue. Uh, almost every interview of a Springfield local I've seen in the last week, and I've watched a lot of them, mentions their driving. Right. That's, <laughs> they're, that's what they're all saying. One of the complainers, we'll meet him soon, is going around documenting every crash that a Haitian gets involved in. Mm. That's a very long video that he's been <laughs> putting together there. <laughs> They've been involved in a lot. I believe them when they say that driving is an issue. Mm. This has led to the first problem, which was in August last year, a Haitian man driving a van crossed the median strip mm. and drove into the path of an oncoming school bus. The mm. school bus swerved to get out of the way. It landed in a ditch. An 11-year-old boy uh, was ejected from the bus and he was killed when the bus landed on top of him. Mm. Uh, more than 20 children were taken to the hospital. The migrant only had a Mexican driver's license. He received nine to 13 years behind bars for involuntary manslaughter. Wow. So he had the book thrown at him. Yeah. Uh, then tensions started to build from there. Shortly after, he started getting the racist claims aimed at the, the Haitian community, uh, the online, so the, the online racist stuff. Um, the, uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll go to there in a second. Other concerns, there was a July 8 letter this year sent by Spring, Springfield City Manager Brian Heck. He sent to Sherrod Brown and Tim Scott, and also Vance was copied in on it. He said, uh, Springfield, Ohio is facing a significant housing crisis in our community. He said it was due to an influx of up to 20,000 Haitians into a community of just under 60,000 previous residents. Okay. This is J.D. Vance two months ago talking mm -hmm. about this letter in the Senate. In my conversations with folks in Springfield, it's not just housing. They're trying to build 5,000 new housing units, which is a very Herculean task in a town of about 55,000 people, but it's also hospital services, it's school services, it's, there's a, there are a whole host of ways in which this immigration problem, I think, is having very real human consequences. So as you can hear at that point in time, mm. the rhetoric was reasonable at yes. that point in time. Okay. Then that is when uh, the comments started appearing on local Facebook groups about mm. Haitian children chasing ducks and geese around the local park. Mm. not stealing them, mm. not eating them, chasing them around the local park. Mm. And there was a place for people to make their complaints, the city commission meetings. It's interesting that no one mentioned the Haitians at all at these committee meetings until late August, but uh, whatever. At the August 13 meeting is the first instance of a complaint about Haitians at a city commission meeting that I could find. I went through a few of them. Mm -hmm. There was one lady who later went viral. This one here. I have the homeless that we're trying to camp out and I have, I have made concessions with them and I try to help them the best I can to keep them from trying to squat on my property. But it is so unsafe. I have men that cannot speak English in my front yard screaming at me, throwing mattresses in my front yard, throwing trash in my front yard. I don't understand what you expect of us as citizens. I mean... I, I understand they're here under temporary protected status and you're protecting them. And I understand that our city services are overwhelmed and understaffed, but who's protecting us? If we're protecting them, who's protecting me? Now, something's weird going on there because in later days, people were tweeting out interviews with locals saying that the TPS guys have jobs and vouchers. Mm. So they price everyone else out of homes because mm. they can afford more rent because ah, they have their right. jobs and vouchers combined. Mm. And it, they're not the homeless people. Yes. The homeless people are the people who can barely afford a house. They become homeless mm. because the Haitians take their homes. 
That's the argument people are using now, right. which is a direct contradiction of what that lady said. Mm. So I don't know what's going on. I don't pretend to know the truth, but she became viral. So I'm just playing mm. it to you as part of the TikTok on how this built. Yes. Okay. Uh, they certainly can't both be true. One of them is true, one of them is not. Okay, then the Nazis enter the fray. Mm. In in August, a neo-Nazi dr- group called Blood Tribe picked up on the rumors and they started posting about them on Telegram and Gab. They held a Nazi march through the streets of Springfield in early August. I've got a photo mm. of it there. And in late August, one of their leaders turned up at a city council meeting before being thrown out. This guy here, his name is Drake Berents. I've come to bring a word of warning. Stop what you're doing before it's too late. Crime and savagery will only increase with every Haitian you bring in. It's suspected that they are the ones who first came up with the allegations that Haitians were eating cats. Right. Uh, I haven't seen any smoking gun proof of that, Mm. but... They certainly take credit for it. Yeah. This was written on their Gab channel. It's interesting to see the news cycle finally blowing up on something we've been at for weeks and weeks. Some big ac- accounts on Twitter have even poached some of our material, but that's okay. That was, that was written during the debate. Mm. One thing that's certain, though, is that the person who amplified the claim was a guy called Captive Dreamer on Twitter. He's one of those edgelords, those hard right edgelords who you're never quite sure when they're being ironic, when mm. they're being serious, and they're kind of borderline Nazi, and yeah, you're yeah. never quite sure, those guys, those alt writers. Uh, like, for instance, one of his tweets says, I believe in eugenics and sterilization just like Hitler. He's one of those guys. Mm. All right. Um, the, uh, when Trump was talking about eating dogs and cats during the debate, Captive Dreamer tweeted out, My greatest work. Yeah. He also said, actually, I just went to their Facebook groups, read their comments and asked locals to reach out to me. You know, journalism, local news essentially blacklisted that stuff. Nobody wanted to spend two meager hours watching a city c- c- committee meeting to hear people's concerns. Well, screw you, because I did as well, Captain Dreamer. <laughs> I imagine that the Blood Tribe members probably would have helped inform him of what the locals thought. Mm. Anyway, New York Times covered the story of Springfield after that third mm. of September, not about cat eating still, just about the issues of a rapidly growing migrant mm. population. They talked about the community health clinic having a 13 fold increase in Haitian patients between 2021 and 2023 from 115 to 1500, overwhelming the staff and the budget. They talked about the rocking horse community health center, a federally subsidized clinic does not turn away anyone. There was a surge in Haitians from uh, causing a cons- consultation that, t- that t- used to take 15 minutes, now take 45 minutes, that kind of stuff. Mm. They needed six Haitian, Haitian Creole speakers to, uh, for, to assist newcomers, which blew their budget. Uh, then at the first day of school, the Springfield City Schools District Registration Department was crammed with immigrant families waiting to enroll children. Uh, so there was overcrowding and stuff. Okay, all that stuff. That's when it started spreading to Republicans. The lady we played before went viral, thanks to Captain Dreamer. He then played her. Mm. Then there was a Facebook post. This is very early September. Mm. A Facebook post wrote about what supposedly their neighbor's daughter's friend said. So this is third-hand info. Mm. It was on the Facebook, Facebook group, Springfield, Ohio, Crime and Information. Warning to all about our beloved pets and those around us. My neighbor informed me that her daughter's friend had lost her cat. One day she came home from work. As soon as she stepped out of her car, looked towards a neighbor's house where Haitians live and saw her cat hanging from a branch like you do a deer for butchering and they were carving it up to eat. I've been told they are doing this to dogs. They've been doing it at Snyder Park with the ducks and geese, as, as I was told, that last bit by rangers and police. Please keep a close eye on these animals. Now, we've sim- since learned her name is Erica Lee. NewsGuard tracked her down and her neighbor. Her neighbor had actually told Lee, who supposedly told Lee a- about it, said, I'm not sure I'm the most credible source because I don't actually know the person who lost the cat. Mm. She said the cat owner was an acquaintance of a friend and that she heard about the supposed incident from that friend who in turn learned about it from, quote, a source that she had. 
There's no explanation for why none of them reported this story to the police. Maybe because it was gossip. September 5, someone called Buckeye Girl posted a screenshot of that post on Twitter with uh, the name redacted. Then September 6 is when, is when it got serious. N Wokeness got a hold of it. N Wokeness is a Twitter account with 2.9 million fo- followers. Not that it's relevant for this story, but they're strongly suspected of being Russian mm. uh, for a, a number of reasons. Uh, N Wokeness said, Springfield is a small town in Ohio. Four years ago, they had 60,000 residents. Under Harris and Biden, 20,000 Haitian immigrants were, stripped, were, were, were shipped to the town. New ducks, now ducks and pets are disappearing. And that post was viewed 4.8 million times in four days. Then we had the picture of the goose guy. That guy there, you've seen him before. Random black guy with a goose. Turned out it was taken on July 28 in Columbus, Ohio. According to the Ohio State Division of Wildlife, that man was picking up two geese that had been run over. And he wasn't Haitian. And he didn't want to eat the geese. He was just picking up geese off the road. That, the man who took the photo has since said he was outraged that right-wingers will take a random picture from the internet and use it as a weapon to further their agenda. <laughs> yeah, welcome to the internet, buddy. Okay, then the then Captive Dreamer tweeted out that clip of that lady before. That went super viral, and then it started spreading faster. September 7, America 2100, an anti-immigrant account, got hold of it, tweeted out the violent crime rates in Springfield. That's the graph there. Note that there was a similar jump all over America, but he acted like the jump in 2022, mm. which was all over America, was just a Springfield jump. jump. Mm. Bullshit. And Wokeness tweets out a video from a Springfield City Commission meeting. Right-wing influencer and podcaster, Anthony Harris, who's the guy who was following the accidents around, he claimed Haitian immigrants were eating ducks in the parks. This is him. They're in the park grabbing up ducks by their neck and cutting their head off and walking off with them and, and eating them. like. So, yeah, he's a right-wing influencer, and that's what uh, he had to say. I, it's not clear where he got that info from, but anyway, could have been the Facebook post. <laughs> so, then douchebag Ian Miles Chong tweets out that video of an alleged cat eater being arrested. That video there. Go like this. Did you eat that cat? Did you eat it? No, why'd you kill it? She was charged with cruelty to companion animals for allegedly killing and eating a cat in public. He said it was a Haitian from Ohio. Was from Ohio. It was from Canton, Ohio, a different place. Mm. 175 miles away. He knew that, Mm. but he didn't say that. Uh, And the woman was not a Haitian. She was a US citizen. Her name is Alexis Farrell. By then, we had enough evidence for an online right-wing feeding frenzy. Uh, even though in reality there was zero evidence at this point in time. So then we get to September 8. Still no Vance or Trump. Mm. Benny Johnson takes over now. (laughs) I don't know if the Russians wanted it or not. But uh, thousands of Haitian migrants terrorize Ohio. Eat family, pets, cats, dogs, and ducks was his podcast. Cat Turd jumped on board. Unless you want your pets eaten, you better vote for Trump. Jack Posobiec jumped on board, tweeting out, there are no specific laws in Haiti Haiti, prohibiting the consumption of a cat meat. What he didn't mention was that until 2018, there were no laws in America either. Mm. Charlie Kirk tweeted about it, and Elon Elon Musk signal boosted Charlie Kirk's tweet, and that is when we get to the real game. Uh, Elon Musk, ever helpful, tweeted out, apparently people's pets' cats have been eaten. Yeah. Thanks for the contribution, Elon. Always invaluable. And then we get to worst on ground, Charlie Kirk. Aiden Clark is another casualty of the Biden administration's insane open borders agenda, just like Lake and Riley in Georgia. His death is also the goal of that agenda. Every time an American dies at the hands of an illegal immigrant, they're spiking the football in the Oval Office and in the Kamala Harris reelection campaign. One step closer to the great replacement. Just to be clear, he's talking about the boy who was run over. Mm. Like, they, that Kamala Harris spiked the ball when she heard that an 11-year-old boy was involved in a bus accident. Thanks, Charlie. How can someone with such a big head have such a small brain? That's my question to you. That's when the cat meme started on September 8th. 
September 9 is when the politicians get involved. J.D. Vance said, Months ago, I raised the issue of Haitian illegal immigrants draining social services and generally causing chaos all over Springfield, Ohio. Reports now show that people have had their pets abducted and eaten by people who shouldn't be in this country. Where is our border czar? Note that his reports seem to be entirely bullshit. Mm. Really interesting thing happened after he tweeted that. The, according to the Wall Street Journal. Yes. He then contacted the city manager, Brian Heck, to fact check it, mm. just to confirm it was right. I, mean, I can't believe he did this. Yeah. Full credit to him to actually try and fact check. Uh, Heck said, he asked point blank, are the rumours true of pets being... So there's a staffer, not Vance. Yeah. We need to be clear about that, mm. a Vance staffer. Are the rumours true of pets being taken and eaten? I told him no. There was no verifiable evidence or reports to show this was true. I told them these claims were baseless. And that same day, the police put out a statement as well, probably related to that fact check, saying they had not received a single report of pets being stolen or eaten by anyone. And they still say that. How did Vance respond? He doubled down that night. Mm. He tweeted out, in the last several weeks, my office has received many inquiries from actual residents of Springfield who said their neighbours, pets, or local wildlife were abducted by Haitian migrants. It's possible, of course, that all of these rumours will turn out to be false. Do you know what's confirmed? That a child was murdered by a Haitian migrant who had no right to be here. That local health services have been overwhelmed. That communicable diseases like TB and HIV have been on the rise. That local schools have struggled to keep up with newcomers who don't know English. That rents have risen so fast that many Springfield families can't afford to put a roof over their head. I want to focus on the phrase, a child was murdered mm. by a Haitian migrant who had no right to be here. It was a car accident. The Haitian was legally here. That's exactly the kind of invective that Vance has spread ever since. Yes. And he also he loves talking about HIV and tuberculosis spreading. So let's talk about that, shall we? Across the whole Clark County, tuberculosis from 2021 to 2023 rose from one case to four cases. Mm. I guess, strictly speaking, that's spreading. Uh, HIV, look, look, I'm being honest here. I, I, I could... I could I could uh, manipulate the, all this, the data to, or just not mention things that don't suit me. Mm. He's right about the HIV. It's going up. Mm. Across the whole Clark County, HIV cases rose from 12 to, in 2021 to 31 in 2023. Mm. It's not exactly an epidemic. No. But look, it, it's gone up. Yes. Okay, so I'll give him that. But overall, sexually transmitted infection cases decreased from, from, uh, in 2023 to the lowest level since 2015. Mm. So I'm not sure it's a big deal. No. As for rents rising so fast, housing prices have risen 9.3% in Springfield in the last year. That's the coin of Zillow. Uh, they've basically followed Ohio trends for the last eight years, though. So the housing prices thing is bullshit. Finally, he said he received all the reports from actual residents. Really? Does anyone believe that any residents who had their cat stolen didn't ring the police didn't ring any officials whatsoever. No, they rang their senator. That's who they rang. Does anyone believe that? I don't think J.D. Vance believes that because he's not that dumb. Uh, obviously, these are political types who are ringing him up, if anyone's ringing him up. Uh, he could only cite one report that he'd received. Hmm. The rest he just said he'd receive reports. But he only cited one. It was a lady who did contact the police, claiming her pet, might have been taken by Haitian neighbours. They may go, hang on, I thought the police said there were no reports. Mm. Yeah, it turned out her cat went missing in late August, mm. but she found the cat in her own basement a few days later. You so the police always <laughs> got to check the basement very carefully. <laughs> yes, of course. This is just my advice to everyone this with is, cats. This is personal for you, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> That's right. Cats are very good at hiding. Okay, then September 10th, the debate. Then we start hearing about the 911 calls. The Federalist was the first to outlet to actually find any actual evidence of anything of any, <laughs> whatsoever. And it was this 911 call about geese. I see a group of Haitian people. There was about four of them. They all had geese in their hand. They got away. Turns out there's one other call. There were two calls. 
Back in March 27, someone called the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife. The caller claimed they saw three people grab a live duck and goose, place them in a trash bag and drive away. No evidence was found of either of the transgressions. But once again, I'm giving you all the information. There were two Mm. calls about geese, zero calls about cats, Mm. two calls about geese. And by the way, goose... Goose hunting is actually legal at different Mm. times of the year, just not the times when those two calls are made. Yes. Okay, and that's that's when, at at this point in time, the circus has really come to Springfield. Uh, Endless right-wing journalists crawling around the place, desperately looking for angry people to interview, some evidence of cat eating. The homeless in Springfield have never received more attention. I've seen so many (laughs) clips of homeless people blaming Haitians for them being homeless. Uh, the New York Post was literally covering minor car pranks if they involved the Haitian. I'm not kidding. The headline was Post witnesses Haitian motorist making illegal turn in Springfield, Ohio, smashes into, in, into mum driving with autistic daughter. This is the photo, Dave. Wow. That's the photo in their scoop. Right? It's just, just any minor accident is getting covered by the New York Post. I saw something like that in Leichhardt yesterday. <laughs> yes. And that's also when the bomb threat started. The, yeah. the death threats, as I said, are, are ubiquitous. The mayor, the city manager, anyone who said anything positive about Haitians gets death threats. But then there were 33 bomb threats. Schools, hospitals, city hall, the Ohio License Bureau, all shut down. Haitians have reported a lot of property damage. Their cars are vandalized, rocks through their windows, acid poured over various bits of their property. I think I saw that in Mississippi burning. It's popped up in, in Springfield now. Mm. Apparently, most, if not all, of the bomb hoaxes are from overseas. Mm. Uh, DeWine has speculated they're mostly from one country. Let's try and mess with America. He won't say which country it is. It still means it's because of the controversy, though. People yeah. going, oh, well, Trump didn't, didn't inspire people in Russia. No, but the controversy inspired people in Russia. Mm. And then they want to mess with Americans. And where'd the controversy come from? Like, he obviously signal boosted it. I mean, I just told you yes. how long it was around before Trump. Yes. But he signal boosted it, right? And this attitude, this is where I start to fault Trump. Do you denounce the bomb threats in Springfield, Ohio? Uh, I don't know what happened uh, with the uh, bomb threats. I know that it's been taken over by uh, illegal migrants, and that's a terrible thing that happened. Springfield was this beautiful town. And now they're going through hell. What a dickhead. Mm. He's told that, that it's getting serious now. His response is, eh, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. Let me just keep on going. Just mm. pouring more petrol on the fire. What a dickhead. Okay, oh, this story makes me very angry. Yeah. Um, the, uh, okay, then uh, we get to Christopher Rufo, who's the J.D. Vance of political activist trolls. He offered $5,000 for hard, verifiable evidence that the Haitian migrants are eating cats in Springfield. Have you seen this? This is what he he, he came up with. Yo, what is this they got on the grill? Is that the biggest cat? Man, listen, man. They're going cat right there. His ass better get missing, man. Look like his homies on the grill, man. What the fuck? Some of Crystal Rufo's finest research. <laughs> now, a lot of lefties have been arguing that that isn't a cat on the barbecue, and Christopher Rufo has gone to exhaustive detail about how he verified that he believes it is, in fact, a cat being cooked. You can look in the homework if you care. I'm not going to go through it. Instead, though, I would focus more on the fact that that video proves nothing. Mm. Focus on that. Yeah. <laughs> By his own admission, these people are from Dayton, Ohio. Yes, not Springfield. They're migrants from the Congo, which is from the literal opposite side of the world from Haiti. You couldn't be further from Haiti unless you were on Mars, right? And this was filmed a year ago. So it's not relevant at all. The wrong place, wrong group of people, wrong time. Who cares? Rufo says the left denied that anyone was eating cats. He's now proved that someone has eaten a cat. So he says the real question is how many more are there? But we know someone's eaten a cat because of that video that Ian Miles Chong's mm. posted before with a mentally ill woman. Like we know someone's eaten a cat. It, uh, the question is have any Haitians been eating cats? And the answer is you've got no evidence. Not even a missing cat. No. (sighs) 
Regardless, he said, Kamala Harris and her media apparatchiks should be ashamed of themselves. Another debunked story that turned out to have merit, Christopher Rufo said. And people have been treating that like some huge scoop. Dave, I know you got to go soon. I've been talking for a while. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get you to weigh in whatever you w- want to say, and then I'll continue the story after you're finished. Yeah. What, what do you want to say about the, about this whole story? I am particularly disgusted with the way that Vance has been saying, oh, well, I had to do this in order to draw attention to the slow-motion humanitarian disaster. Yes. You know what's a humanitarian disaster? An earthquake that kills tens of thousands of people and leaves a society in such disarray that they can't even establish a government afterwards. Yes. That's a humanitarian disaster. That's what these Haitians have actually fled from. Yes. What is happening in Springfield, Ohio, is actually pretty typical of the chronic lack of public services and infrastructure in a lot of American towns. Uh, not just ones that are, uh, you know, looking at migrant influxes uh, influxes now. Um, there are solutions to these problems that are not happening because of the permanent paralysis of all levels of American government. The as, as Mike DeWine pointed out, these immigrants were part of an economic revitalization mm. of uh, of the town. Now, economic growth brings problems with it. Like, uh, and the, the problems are very uneven. So, the, you know, growth in accommodation prices, yeah, that's a real problem for people who can't afford housing. Uh, other people benefit from it, people who actually, uh, you know, who own homes. You get these unevenly, uh, you know, unevenly distributed problems. It seems... 70% of the Springfield people own homes, by yes. the way. Yeah, yeah. Now, you know, a lot of the people who are suffering the most from these infrastructural problems are the immigrants themselves who are relying on things like uh, like free federal clinics. Now, yeah, the, the driving thing is bad. That's a, that's, mm. that's a problem. The father of the child who was killed in that bus accident. We'll get to him. Yes. <laughs> really, really objected to the yeah. way that this, was, uh, this mm. was being used. So, first of all, trying to draw attention to these problems doesn't warrant accusing an entire group of people of eating people's pets, Mm. right? And we have to be clear about how bad this accusation is. You're accusing them basically of depriving people of their beloved pets Mm. and of committing this act of pet eating, which people associate with with something that is not human. And it's an old trope about migrants eating animals that are not supposed to be Mm. eaten. The fact they're saying they're abducting people's pets just adds this, uh, you know, other emotional layer to it. So nothing justifies J.D. Vance, who has admitted that the rumours may be false, who we now know knows that the rumours were false. You know, nothing justifies him using that to draw attention to this issue in this way. And on J.D. Vance, because we're not going to get to talk about Laura Loomer, uh, so Laura Loomer, who's been travelling around with Trump, who is another possible source of these rumours, the people saying that might have actually been where Trump's original attention to them came from. Yeah. Um, after the Trump debate, she posted a delightful joke uh, saying that if Kamala Harris wins the White House, the White House will smell like curry and uh, media questions will be answered through a switchboard that nobody understands. A call centre. Yeah, call yeah. centre that nobody uh, understands, right? So mm. awful joke invoking just terrible stereotypes about Indians. Mm. Uh, You know, the media understandably pushed J.D. Vance on this because J.D. Vance is married to someone from India, someone who talked about his curry cooking skills. Mm. And the way that J.D. Vance dealt with that was to say, um, well, people can say whatever they want about dietary preferences in the White House. I cook a mean chicken curry. She wasn't talking about dietary preferences in the White House. She was making a racist joke about the same group of people that his wife come from. And then he went and says, well, Laura Loomer isn't running for president. She's just travelling around with Trump for some reason. Mm. You know, Trump, as as usual, claims he doesn't really know anything about her, but, you uh, you know, she's a free spirit. So this is the point of degradation that Vance has got to. Okay, he is married to an immigrant. He has biracial children. 
he will not only not defend other non-white immigrants, he will actively attack them for political gain because he knows that that's what Trump wants him to do. Mm. He won't defend Indian immigrants from racist attacks by a Trump surrogate who is following Trump around everywhere. This is the level of moral degradation that he has reached. He stopped casting a shadow a very <laughs> long time ago. And increasingly now, you know, I used to be vaguely interested in these, uh, you know, pieces about J.D. Vance's intellectual world. I just don't bother with them anymore. Yeah. There, is, there is nothing more to see uh, other than somebody who has sold his soul for a very low price. Yeah, I've got to say, he's got, until now, Yeah, we've been looking at his quotes from 2016 and mm. 2015 about Trump and going, oh my God, that's, you know, what a, what a hypocrite because now he's sucking up to the guy now. It, <clears throat> now it's changed. Now we're looking at the quotes and going, oh my God, what a hypocrite. He is that now. Yes. Yeah. Not, not, he's been nice to Trump. Who's no, that no. now? Yeah, yeah. He is that now. His quotes from before now are condemning him yes. now. Yeah. And I've got to say, I, I just, I, like, you know, I've given him a fair go. Yeah. Like, I really have. And, like, and, I've, and in policy time, whenever I finally yeah. get to it, then policy time, I've got examples of him doing some good stuff. Like, I, even now, mm. he, like, he hasn't stopped being smart. He hasn't stopped being, like, he hasn't stopped uh, being able to understand policy and all that kind of stuff. But he's using that brain. To be awful. Yes. And because he knows on a very deep level that he's doing something very wrong, he gets very, very defensive. Yes. Uh, about mm. all of this, which is a deeply unattractive trait. Anyway, on that point. Dave. Uh, I have to be off. I will see you next week. and See you next week. After the white flash, folks, it's a cracker of Chaz uh, <laughs> Unleashed. We're going to be uh, finally hearing the end of the, of, the, of the Ohio Springfield story. And, uh, and I'm going to continue on where Dave left off on JD Vance. Don't worry about that. We've got right. a lot to say about him. And, uh, and we'll try and get some correspondence in as well. We'll see you after the white flash. Till next week, Dave. Stay peppy. Stay peppy. Welcome to the other side of the white flash. This is Chaz Unleashed. And I just want to acknowledge I'm aware of how bad the audio was in this particular podcast. I was the one trying to deal with it. Yeah, look, we're going to get this sorted out real soon. I can just taste it. It's really close, but I acknowledge it was bad. But I don't want to talk about it anymore because I've got 22 minutes to try and finish off this Springfield story, and it's more than 22 minutes, so there might be some dodgy edits. Uh, Dave teed us up to talk about one of the loudest sources of pushback, which were to the entire Springfield story, which were actually Nathan, Nathan Clark, the dad of Aiden Clark, the boy who was killed, the 11 year old boy who was killed in the bus accident. Uh, the, uh, he turned up at, uh, one of the, one of the meetings, the, the committee meetings, the city committee meetings, and he wanted to say that he resented the way his son's memory is being co-opted by, well, white nationalists, amongst others. I wish that my son, Aiden Clark, was killed by a 60-year-old white man. I bet you never thought anyone would ever say something so blunt. But if that guy killed my 11-year-old son... The incessant group of hate-spewing people would leave us alone. The last thing that we need is to have the worst day of our lives violently and constantly shoved in our faces. Did you know that one of the worst feelings in the world is to not be able to protect your child? Even worse, we can't even protect his memory when he's gone. That is incredibly sad. And uh, I would recommend, by the way, that you don't read the comments under that video on Twitter because... They are almost entirely about how these parents uh, are race traders and woke scumbags. And some have even added that they, of course, deserve to be executed because it seems everyone involved in this deserves to be executed in some way if they're supporting the Haitians. Uh, that viral lady I played before, uh, the, the original clip from one of these uh, city committee meetings, also pushed back hard at the September 10 meeting, that's the same day as the debate, 
emphasizing that whatever was going on with her, I still don't know what it was, it had nothing to do with the an any animals being eaten. I did not mean to bring any ill will. And about the ducks and the cats, I'm the crazy cat lady in my town. In my, and I'm not missing any. Everybody's present and accounted for. And if they were coming up out of our park with geese or ducks, I would be one of the first people to see it. I'm telling you, it's not happening. There was a lot of pushback from locals at this point in time. This was the beginning of the, the backlash to the backlash as they were getting nervous about what was happening to their town, as they were getting flooded with not Haitians, but uh, journalists and bloggers and tweeters. Uh, they didn't like that much. They liked that a lot less than they liked the original uh, Haitians, I think. Um, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine has a positive view about the migrants. He's done what J.D. Vance should have been doing, which is trying to improve the situation rather than exploiting it. He's sending state troopers to help address the reckless driving issue, and he's also dedicating $2.5 million towards healthcare to help reduce wait times. So that sounds like a positive move. Uh, so let me tell you some of, the, some of the truth of the situation. I've just told you the story leading up to now, the, the, the blow by blow, a story of, of what happened, what people did. Let me give you some facts. Like I said before, Haitians are overwhelmingly Christian, uh, which kind of, it kind of proves that the white Christian nationalists are more into the white and the nationalists than they are into the Christian bit because they don't seem to, be, to care much that they're Christian. Uh, also, I can't say this enough, they are legal. They have TPS visas. Those make them legal. So people calling them illegals and saying they're being dumped by the government, all the rest of it. No, they are legal people who can go anywhere they want. They make their own choices. Uh, Trump and Vance in particular love saying that they're illegal. Not the case. They are also spectacular integrators. I've said that a number of times on Planet America and on PEP. And now I'm going to give you some numbers. Within one year of entering America, 56% of adult Haitians are employed. That's including old people and spouses. That's just people over 18, okay? 56%. Generally speaking, 69% of Haitians are employed overall, not just up to a year, but overall, 69% of Haitians are, are employed compared to 65% of other immigrants and 60% of native-born Americans. So... They are 9% more of them are employed than native-born Americans. And descendants of Haitians, 82% of them are employed. Even though most Haitians come over super poor, in their first 15 years, only 16.8% of them are under the poverty line, compared to 11.5% of Americans as a whole. So 5.3% more of them are under the poverty line than, than Americans. But they basically are all under the poverty line when they come over. Well, most of them are. The, the vast majority of them are. And so the reason that mo the reason that doesn't become a problem to, well, it stops being a problem pretty quickly is because they get jobs, because they're employed. And after 15 years, by the way, fewer of them are under the poverty line than Americans are. Only 28% of Haitians have a college degree compared to 42% of native-born Americans. That makes sense. They've come from Haiti. That's not a very well-educated country. 40% uh, of other immigrants uh, have, a, have a college degree. So Haitians are relatively poorly educated. But look at their kids. 54% of their kids have a degree. Way more than the 42% of native-born Americans. Once again, they work hard and they integrate. That's what we keep on hearing the, the immigration skeptics want to see. They are actually delivering it, the Haitians. Uh, almost twice as many Haitian descendants enroll in the military than native-born Americans do. That's 0.65% to 0.34%. And as far as imprisonment goes, this here is stark. All native-born Americans are incarcerated at a rate of about 1,450 per 100,000. Illegal Haitians 
are incarcerated about 900 per 100,000. So that's less than native born Americans. All illegal immigrants incarcerated about 850 per 100,000. All legal immigrants incarcerated about 380 per 100,000. But all legal Haitians are incarcerated at a rate of about 290 per 100,000. That's a fifth of the rate of native borns. And reminder, all of these people are legal Haitians. Now, some have argued that it's not right to call them all legal Haitians because some of them came over illegally, but then they got the TPS status after they arrived. So while now they are officially legal Haitians, the people, when, when they came over, they were the kind of people who would come over illegally, not legally, not go through the proper processes. And so we should, we should think of them like they're illegal Haitians. That's how the argument goes. That's, it does complicate matters, the, the, the fact that some of them are like that. We're talking about 300,000 out of 1.1 million, though. So the vast majority of them are just flat-out legal Haitians, even if you use that argument. And also, we don't know if any people in Springfield are like that. Like, we got no idea who, which Haitians they are. So this is all speculative. My point is the vast majority of them are legal. Uh, either, well, they came over legally uh, through a proper process, whatever that may be, and all of them now are officially legal. Remember also, Haitians who come over are much more likely to be young and male. So that imprisonment rate is even more spectacular because remember, young male people are much more likely to be imprisoned. So it suggests that they are, they are astonishingly, they have an astonishingly low imprisonment rate. Okay, how about the knocks on the Haitians? Because there's always two sides. The schools and the health clinics being overrun. Uh, they, they need extra funds for translators. That, they, those are all facts. Uh, supposedly. But as we're about to see, the official stats don't confirm this at all. I'm not saying people are lying. I'm just saying the truth might be in between. Like maybe they, maybe the Haitians stick out a little bit more and they attract people's attention a little bit more, but the, it's, it's interesting what, what, what the stats say. But let's say it's true. Let's say it's 100% true. Health clinics being overrun, uh, schools being overrun, translators required. The answer is simple. More funding for a growing city. You don't remove the workers that are powering the city, do you? Uh, White nationalists uh, seem to be of the view that the fact that Haitians are trying to escape an awful country is a reason not to take them. They think these people bring the culture of Haiti with them, hurting Americans. Now, you might think I'm verbaling them there. I'm being unfair. I'm not. This is a quote from Don Jr., Don Trump Jr. on the Charlie Kirk podcast. You look at Haiti, you look at the demographic makeup, you look at the average IQ if you import the third world into your country, you're going to become the third world. That's just basic. It's not racist. It's just fact. Yeah, it's not racist. They all have lower IQs, according to Don Jr. I'm not aware how many of them take IQ tests. Maybe they take the kinds of IQ tests that uh, Donald Trump took to prove that he's a super genius. Uh, look, that line of argument's been used against migrants forever. A white nationalist also, they've been Googling voodoo quite a lot. There was a New York Times article in 2010 that said 50% to 95% of Haitians practice at least elements of voodoo, often in conjunction with Catholicism. People like Tucker Carlson have leapt to interpret that as meaning that they sacrifice animals and humans. But there is a voodoo paraphernalia store in Springfield and it sells stupid little trinkets. It doesn't sell human sacrifice. It seems like the extent, to the extent that anyone has actually carried through their, the cultural traditions of voodoo, those traditions are severely watered down from what we believe them to be from old movies. <laughs> the locals certainly deny that anyone practices voodoo seriously and there's no talk of human sacrifice or animal sacrifice or any kind of sacrifice. There is no evidence of any animals being taken. But there is a lot of evidence of Haitians filling the church pews on Sunday you draw your own conclusions. The local poor. Now, here is a, a real knock. Um, Haitians are taking jobs that these people say that they would like to take. And now the employers say that, these, that, that the Haitians are just much better employees. They're much harder workers, they say. And that may be true. And that might be great for, 
for the, the businesses, the individual businesses, but it's not great for the people who aren't getting jobs and they are resentful. That is just a fact. Um, the uh, Haitians uh, seem also to be working a lot of overtime and because they're hard workers and combined with the vouchers they get with their TPS, with their TPS uh, visas to, for accommodation, they can easily afford housing at prices that the, the, the poor people on locate, from, from Springfield who already, already live there can't afford. And so, theoretically, we're hearing about about the locals being priced out of accommodation because there aren't any more houses. They're trying to build houses, but they haven't been built yet. So, to the extent that there are more people uh, and there aren't more houses, then uh, then there are people who are, who are becoming homeless. That, that is that is that seems to be true. And so you can understand the poor resenting them. Uh, these people obviously are also Trump central. They're rural working class resentful types. So you can understand why Trump and Vance would want to appeal to these people. That's their base. But Trump and Vance aren't offering solutions. They're just offering cultural sympathy. That's not a solution. Let's talk a bit more about J.D. Vance. He never misses a chance to say that they're here because of Kamala Harris's policy, as if she's the person responsible for immigration policy in the, in the Biden administration. Even if you call her a border czar, I think Joe Biden's the one making the decisions. Um, but the Haitians who exist in Springfield, they didn't necessarily even come over under Biden. There's 1.1 million of them in America. Only 300,000 have come over under Biden. So... It's, it's, there's a lot of Haitians there who, who they might, they might have come under Trump for all we know. And, uh, he, and J.D. Vance also has a terrible habit of misstating facts. I'll, I'll give you an example here. I was told, Dana, that the American me by the American media that it was baseless that migrants were capturing the geese from the local park pond and eating them. And yet there are 911 calls from well before this ever became a viral sensation of people complaining about that exact thing happening. No, J.D., the 911 calls didn't say anything about eating geese. They just said people were seen with dead geese. You just made the bit up about eating the geese and acted like it was confirmed when you knew it wasn't. That's not an accident. J.D. Vance is super careful with words. He knew exactly what he was saying then. Also, J.D. Vance likes to say he's just listening to his constituents. And the real story is that they're being ignored. But the irony is... He is the one that's ignoring them most of all. The Republican city leaders and the bulk of the comments by far are from people saying that the Haitians are, perf are performing a valuable role in the city, but the city needs help accommodating them. When the city manager first wrote J.D. Vance looking for help, he wasn't saying get rid of the Haitians. He was hoping for financial assistance. But J.D. Vance completely ignores that and simply fixates on reducing immigration and getting rid of the Haitians, which almost none of the locals have asked for. This is a great example right here. If the path to prosperity was flooding your nation with low-wage immigrants, then Springfield, Ohio would be the most prosperous country and the most prosperous city in the world. America would be the most prosperous country in the world because Kamala Harris has flooded the country with 25 million legal, legal aliens. What's actually happened is that over the past three and a half years, while we've had this massive influx of illegal labor, what's happened? We've had skyrocketing inflation, lower take-home pay, Americans more dissatisfied with the direction of the country and the economy than they've been in a generation. This is not the path to prosperity, no matter how much a Wall Street bank says that it is. That is psychotic behavior. They are not illegal, no matter how many times you say it. And there haven't been 25 million Ill illegal aliens. There have been between two and three million illegals let into the country under Biden. Don't count the numbers at the borders. Most of them get bounced. Count the ones who actually get in the country between two and three million. Learn to count, champ. He's blaming migrants for inflation as well. How does that work? 
It doesn't work. It doesn't make any sense at all. And most of all, these are not low-wage immigrants as much as he likes to say they are. They are all paid at market rates. Let me give you some stats. In 2020, the median annual household income in Springfield was $39,000. Two years later, it was $45,000 with all the Haitians there. The mean hourly wage in Springfield jumped 18% between 2020 and 2023, from $21.33 to $25.16. It jumped 18%, when nationally it jumped 13%. So wages are going up more in Springfield than the rest of America. And by the way, before the Haitians arrived, the unemployment rate was 5%. Now it's 4.7%. So even those poor people I described before who can't get jobs, there are fewer of them not getting jobs than there were before the Haitians arrived. That's partly because when more people arrive, they spend more money and that provides more more opportunities for businesses and employment opportunities. That's how basic capitalism works. The poverty rate in Springfield in 2020, pre-COVID, was 23%. Now it's 22.7%. It's gone down with the Haitians. There are some facts for you, JD. And America, by the way, is easily the most prosperous country in the world, precisely because of immigration, like you don't know that. Springfield is inarguably far more prosperous now than it was back in uh, 2012, when a Gallup survey named Springfield the unhappiest city in America. That's where Vance wants to go back to. Vance's constituent, The guy from McGregor Metal we played before said on the record, the fact of the matter is, without the Haitian associates that we have, we'd have trouble filling these positions. But Vance is ignoring those constituents. He wants to screw over his own constituents and get them back, put them back into a position where they were less happy and less prosperous so he can give Donald Trump a talking point. He is awful. Reminds me of J.D. Vance in 2016 when he came out with this quote. Trump makes people I care about afraid. Immigrants, Muslims, etc. Because of this, I find him reprehensible. God wants better of us. You, sir, are a sellout. You've sold out harder than grand final tickets. You are terrible. I'm so disappointed in J.D. Vance over this issue. Meanwhile, Trump has been literally campaigning against Springfield itself. He's just saying the whole place is a shitty place now. And illegal Haitians, and he came in, illegal Haitian migrants taking over a beautiful place. It was so beautiful. Springfield, Ohio. I was there. I campaigned there a while ago. Springfield, it was so beautiful. Now it's just, what a place. How is that helping the people of Springfield running down their city? It's not. And also, Trump clearly has no idea what he's talking about. Get a load of this. I can say this. Uh, We will do large deportations from Springfield, Ohio. Large deportations. We're going to get these people out. We're bringing them back to Venezuela. Look, I'm just about to run out of time. And so I'm going to skip the numbers section. Hopefully, I'll get into that in a future Pep, it's quite complicated, so it'll take me a little bit of time, uh, and it's a little bit uncertain. But I just want to wrap it up with why is this happening? Just go through some of the guesses, because we can't know for sure. The first guess is, well, maybe Trump's just a bit racist. Um, Remember, Haiti is the original shithole country. (laughs) Well, that Trump was rumoured to have said that we we can't confirm it. These are anonymous quotes. Um, But there's some more anonymous quotes where they came from. Recall when Trump uh, theoretically complained that if Nigerian immigrants were allowed to stay, they would never go back to their huts. Quote, Nigerians are literally the most educated migrant group in America. 61% of Nigerians hold at least a bachelor's degree. Once again, that's anonymous. So maybe he's just getting a bad rap. But if he's not, Maybe he's just racist. Maybe it's a distraction. This is the Pete Buttigieg explanation. This is a strategy to get us talking about the latest crazy thing that he did, whatever urban legend he amplifies. Right now it's about people eating cats or geese or whatever. 
because he cannot afford for us to be talking about his record. He doesn't want us talking about the fact that we lost manufacturing jobs on his watch even before COVID, uh, which is why the United Auto Workers are against him. He doesn't want us talking about the fact that uh, his main economic policy promise he actually kept was to cut taxes for the rich. He doesn't want us talking about uh, how he demolished the right to choose in this country, that he's the reason that even IVF could be banned in many places in this country. The last thing he wants us to do is to talk about his record or his agenda. So what he wants us talking about is whatever crazy nonsense he can thrust into the center of the internet and the media conversation, which this week happens to be the stuff about eating cats or dogs or geese or whatever. Distracting people with an absurd eye-catching flourish, it actually has a term. I don't know if you know what it is. It's quite funny in this case, dead catting. How about that? Uh, that term was coined by Boris Johnson via an Australian, actually. Uh, Boris Johnson, uh, the quote was, there's one thing that is absolutely certain about throwing a dead cat on the dining room table, and I don't mean that people will be outraged, alarmed, disgusted. That's true, but irrelevant. The key point, says my Australian friend, is that everyone will shout, geez, mate, <laughs> that's his Australian, there's a dead cat on the table. In other words, they'll be talking about the dead cat, the thing you want them to talk about, and they will not be talking about the issue that has been causing you so much grief. There's so many reasons that Donald Trump might be dead catting. I'm not sure that's it, but it could be. What I think it's about is keeping immigration in the news. According to Gallup, 55% of people want immigration to be reduced. That's the highest level since 2002. According to Axios, a majority of people now want mass deportations. They have never, in a poll, said that they had a majority wanting mass deportations, which is now Trump's policy, obviously. Maybe Trump has just decided that he'll do whatever he can to keep everyone talking about immigration for the next six weeks. Mark Caputo from The Bulwark spoke to one advisor, Trump advisor, and they said, we talk about abortion, we lose. We talk about immigration, we win. And there's evidence out there of this. Trump is staying to move on to a new town called Charleroi in Pennsylvania. Trump says that it experienced a 2,000% increase in the population of Haitian migrants under Kamala Harris. Migrants rose from 120 to 2,000. So 2,000% is doing a lot of maths work there. Um, 2,000, it, it is a lot for a small town, but I think Trump might be overselling that a bit. Uh, will it work? Will the strategy work of keeping immigration in news? Look, immigration-related chaos is a good strategy. If Trump, immigration has a lot of salience at the moment, if he's creating this sense of just chaos everywhere all around America because of immigration issues, then why wouldn't people vote for him? The one thing they trust about him is that he cares about reducing immigration. So, that would make sense. If they just want the noise to stop, if they just think it's out of control, that's when you get a strong man in. That's when you get someone who says, I'll oh, just deport them all. So I think it's actually a good electoral strategy. Then again, he did try this in 2022 as well. He tried exactly the same strategy then and it didn't work. Also, he isn't the only person playing this game. Kamala Harris right now, I'll talk about this in the next pep, is gearing up to play exactly the same game with abortion. Every single day or two, there's another abortion story which she's promoting and you can see her revving up. So the last six weeks of this, of this uh, campaign, you have one side talking about abortion all the time and the other side talking about immigration all the time. I don't know who wins out of that, but both of them, their strategies make sense. So we'll see how that works out. I can see why Trump thinks this will work. How will you feel if Trump doesn't win, Diane? Petrified. Petrified? Petrified. Petrified. Of, of what may be happening? All the illegals coming through, they're going to make it up here to Michigan. What is going on at the border scares me to death. Mm. I, I, I just hold my breath every day hoping that somebody that I love doesn't get hurt. Really? You think about it that much? Yes. The tactic is ugly, but it's effective. That's why people do it. Uh, there's so much more to say about all this stuff. I haven't even mentioned Aurora, um, which is essential to this whole story, but look, I've got to go. I'm out of time. I'm going to try and do a bonus pod this week. I tried last week. I couldn't get together. I'll try again this week. Uh, and so I'll see you either early this week or on Friday when we're going to have a very special announcement. Oh, it's exciting. Until then, stay peppy.